mixed cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, and the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm going to do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. 
at this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the Epoch device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. You need to put, hey everybody, good morning. Um, uh, Joe Basha here, your host of Perf Web and all that kind of stuff. I'm here this morning with Tammy. She's sitting right next to me. You'll see her in just a second. Got to go through all this stuff first real quick. Sponsors, click them, like them, follow them, do something with them. I appreciate that because we appreciate them and we need them. Social media, make sure you like, follow, share us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Make sure on the YouTube you give us the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, click the bell for notifications. Check out our websites, call us, let us know some kind of, if you want a topic covered, you just want to make some nice comments about me, uh, you want to join our faculty, which would be great. Uh, you can find us at uh, contact at perfusioneducation.com. Yeah, and our websites are perfweb.us, and perfusioneducation.com. Make sure you, you, you got those sites right, okay? Uh, when you see this uh, thing here, it's our call-in number, 832-239-5358. The phone lines will be open when we get to that discussion period. So when you see that, you know the phone lines are open. Please call in if you'd like to. And we are exploring, Magic, we are, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, one, of the, one of the producers in the back, are, are we going to get to a point where we have like a like a Skype call-in number for people in Europe and stuff? Because during this these programs in the morning, we get a lot of people from Europe. So I think we're trying to work on that. Is that something that's going to happen maybe? We will. We will? Okay, so we are going to do that. We're working on that solution so that there's not a toll charge. We could do it via, I guess, WhatsApp, Skype, or one of those kinds of things. Uh, anyway, so let me introduce you to Tammy Sparacino. You all know Tammy. You've met Tammy many times, so I won't go through a big, long introduction, but she is a perfusionist extraordinaire, 20 years of experience, came out of Texas Heart Institute, works here in Houston currently with Houston Extracorporeal Technologies, and she brought to me this idea about doing a journal club, but in an untraditional way. So it's not a pure journal club where we're really critiquing the paper. We're just using the article, the publication, as a platform to discuss the topic and look and see both what their sort of conclusions were, but also maybe ways of doing something we didn't think of previously, and also uh, looking at other references from their article to validate kind of for us 
should we be doing this? Are we doing this? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Mm -hmm. So that's what I think anyway. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. So I just thought that because this would be a, calling it Journal Club would give us a place to go for timely and current topics that are being published, you know, within our uh, area of interest and give us interesting topics to discuss more roundtable kind of uh, topics and to see if there's any new technologies or procedures that would be interesting to apply to our practice. Mm -hmm. Good. I think that's a great idea. In fact, I love the idea. Um, is everything okay as far as sound goes? Yep. Good. Thumbs up. All right. So okay. you're good. All right. So I guess let's go ahead and get started. I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Today we are going to be discussing this article the predictors of heparin resistance before cardiovascular operations in adults. This article was published in 2018. I um, found the article in the uh, Annals of Thoracic Surgery. Uh, you can see there are quite a few contributors. Uh, this is a Kawatsu, excuse my pronunciation, and colleagues. They're over in Japan and they um, did this study at the um, Tohoku University Graduate School of Medicine. Okay, so let's go ahead and see what this is all about. So here's the abstract. The background is that heparin resistance is often encountered during cardiovascular uh, operations. I'm sure we've all run into that a few times. The aim of the study was to clinically valid, find clinically valid uh, preoperative predictors related to heparin resistance. They had a pretty large study at one, um, one site and they actually came up with some interesting results and they've got excellent data um, in some of their tables that I'll show you shortly um, where they have uh, had several predictors that were clinically significant. Their overall conclusions were um, had, a, I, I will go through point by point with their tables, but they did find about four predictors of people who were going to have heparin resistance. Okay, so why this paper was published? They published the paper because heparin resistance um, is found in um, many uh, cardiac cases anywhere from 4 to 22 percent depending on what articles uh, you use for reference. So this is a problem that we all face and it's one of those problems that it happens at the worst time when you finally mm -hmm. figure out that you're gonna have a problem you're ready to go on bypass and now you're, you're cannulated. Yeah they are ready mm -hmm. and you're just watching the ACT climb and it stops. And yes. So you repeat it and it stops. All right, what? Here's their problem. They wanted to find, although there have been quite a few studies, uh, one specifically with Renucci, I believe, that um, have looked at heparin resistance, but they felt like not all um, parameters of these patients were looked at, and they wanted to find multiple clinically valid predictors that they can uh, know in advance so that they're able to be a little more prepared when they have these types of patients rather than finding out interoperatively, interoperatively at the last minute. Okay, so these are their methods and procedures. Good morning, Patrick. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Got it? <laughs> thank you. All right, so this was done in Japan, as I mentioned. 489 patients were looked at uh, in a retrospective, non-randomized, single-centered um, manner. They found 25 patients that had heparin resistance. They uh, included all adults uh, age greater than 20. They looked over a two-year period, January 2010 through December 2012. They included all procedures, including uh, emergencies and redos. And this is what their conclusions were. They found that uh, preoperative high uh, fibrinogen levels, a smoking habit, whether current or previous, uh -huh. 
uh, uh, COPD, and interestingly enough, they had one particular procedure that um, had a clinically significant uh, factor for heparin resistance, and that was the chronic aortic dissection. Really? Not acute. Yeah. Chronic. So yeah. here's some of their uh, um, tables, and I normally wouldn't include this much data, but I thought these were really easy to read, and so I've highlighted the things that were they found to be clinically significant. So just in their patient characteristics, males were um, clinically significant for this. Um, former smoking in general, but they didn't really have any active smokers. So just former smoking, you can see that 19 of their 25 were smokers. Wow. COPD, 13 of the 25. And also duration of heparin use, which I think that's common knowledge. We all kind of know if you have a patient who's been on heparin for a while, that that is um, often yeah. an indicator. But it was um, at a higher incidence, not just the lower, you know, the, the control group, the non-heparin resistant group, uh, averaged about four days, but the uh, heparin resistant group was a double that at eight. Hmm. Okay, and then here's what I was alluding to earlier, the type of disease. You can see that the chronic dissection had seven of 25. <coughs> So I thought that was kind of interesting. And you can see they had all kinds of uh, operations, pretty much anything you can think of they had included in this. These are the preoperative uh, blood labs that were done. Uh, some of them I think we already are familiar with, high um, platelet counts, uh, high fibrinogen levels, uh, positive D-dimers. Um, this one was kind of interesting that you can see that in the control group, 39 of theirs had low AT3 levels, but they did not develop uh, any heparin resistance problems. So it, that is not, at previously, that has been one of the major yeah. factors that people looked at. But just because you have a low AT3 level does not um, mean that you're definitely going to have a heparin resistance problem. Um, elevated creatinins, and then elevated uh, C-reactive proteins, which is, of course, an indicator for inflammation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I thought we could have a little bit of a discussion. I've got uh, some points from this that we could talk about, just generally speaking about anticoagulation and heparin resistance. Mm -hmm. First off, do you have any comments or questions about the article specifically? About the article specifically? No, not really about the article. Um, I do want to point out, just in case anybody didn't notice, we are joined by Patrick. Patrick, good morning. It's very nice to see you. Mm -hmm. That one's fine. Um, <laughs> and uh, not, not necessarily, and where did you say it was done? It was in Japan, right? In Japan. It was in Japan, mm -hmm. which, you know, I mean, that's, but I'm, 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 it, what's interesting to me. At their, think, at one of their school of medicines. Is, yeah, what's interesting to me is, Positive D-dimer generally indicates some kind of you know, uh, inflammatory process going mm -hmm. on. You're in the hospital a long time, D-dimers mm -hmm. are going to climb, mm -hmm. right? Smoking is inflammatory, right? Mm -hmm. COPD creates an inflammatory sort of well, issue. It itself may be somewhat inflammatory, but right. I think just the stress associated. So it almost sounds like stress, chronic aortic dissection mm -hmm. and CRP levels. I mean... I, that's what it sounds like to me, mm -hmm. is that anyone in a, in a pro-inflammatory state may be heparin resistant. And maybe that's the issue with some people experiencing. I haven't experienced it. I don't know about you guys, but I haven't experienced this hypercoagulability that they've referred to with COVID, um, unless that's just a common reaction and because there is an inflammatory process going on it seems like it is an issue with COVID but really it's an issue just with um, the inflammatory the, the cytokine kind storm that they're experiencing what do you think um, actually I wish I had uh, printed out this article because in doing a little bit of research when I was just looking over some of the topics that they presented I uh, saw an interesting uh, image come up when I was searching for some things that showed um, a, a cell from a COVID positive patient and showing the heparin uh, trying to, uh, the way it, it, 
it infiltrated into the um, cytoplasm, I guess, and it was kind of locked out and, um, I guess, uh, immobilized is kind of what they were saying in this image. And there was a whole article that some uh, people had done over hypercoagulability and trying to figure out why the heparin is not being able to, you know, do its anticoagulation. At it's not being effective. Right, yeah. exactly. It was a really interesting point. And yeah. uh, I just uh, glanced through the report, but I thought it was very, very interesting because I we have seen that. I've uh, been with a patient where I think that there were clots when there shouldn't have been clots in, in the ECMO circuit. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do think it is a problem. During this COVID experience. During this COVID experience. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it, and, and again, I think that's reasonable and I think that, that, that you did see that. I think other people have also reported it. So Patrick, what's your, what's your, what's your opinion about that? On the COVID patient, I may know exactly who you're talking to. Is uh -huh. that the one we had to change the circuit out because yeah. we had the decoupling? Yeah. yeah. So there was somebody who we had. Who was uh -huh. But I mean, is it, do you uh, see it as a common thread? Uh, with COVID, no, than, not common. You know, because I mean, I, we do a lot of ECMO and I mm -hmm. think that we've just been so, I don't know, my experience is that, at least my opinion, is that we've been so inundated with these COVID patients lately that we sort of forget that I've done just normal cases. I've done normal cases in the past that a few of them were just heparin resistant for some mm -hmm. reason. But now when they're COVID positive, it's like there's hypercoagulability with COVID. But I don't know how, re I don't know if that's really true. And I'm not 100% positive. Well, I don't think we've seen it a lot in our particular ECMOs, but I do think that talking to some of the ICU you know, nurses or nurse practitioners or whoever that you're talking to on your COVID floors, that they are seeing it in their non-ECMO patients. You know, they're having a lot more uh, thrombetic. At, PEs. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so if they're having them there, then of course we're going to be having them in our ECMOs, whether we see them necessarily or not. I mean, I think we, um, we all know that the oxygenator is going to catch most of the problems, and that's probably where... For a well, while. Well, for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so we may not even be aware mm -hmm. of them. The reason we were aware of the one that Patrick and I are referring to is it was it was uh, very obvious something was not, you know, correct. Mm -hmm. and something that was uh, going on that doesn't normally go on. We were actually having a problem with our um, pump head staying on the... Uh, motor drive right it was decoupling it was right. decoupling multiple times and yeah. uh at first we you know thought of course it was just a mechanical issue you know it wasn't snapped in or someone bumped it or something yeah. of that nature but it happened to multiple clinicians over the entire day and so we finally you know figured out it must be something in there that is you know messing with the magnet so yeah yeah good mm -hmm. yeah. balls what did you ever dry uh flush it out and look? We didn't because that patient was not that just... That was the HIV positive. Yeah, we had... A, they had a lot of problems. They had a lot of problems, and we just didn't feel like it was probably worth the risk of what we were going to have to do to flush that out in the ICU. And I would agree with that. Yeah. But we probably should have. It would have been know. interesting for sure. Yeah. yeah. So let's just... Uh, I took. I just walked in, but I took a couple notes when, when you were talking, and I, I guess I think of things more mechanically. And uh, let's just talk about... You know, the two, we have got the, the chronic dissection, mm -hmm. and then we've got smoking. And you were talking about anti-inflammatory, you were talking about uh, inflammatory Pro -inflammatory response, or, yeah. right? or, or yeah. inflammatory processes or right. cytokine storms mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, so I think of the dissection as, you know, you've probably got eddies going, and this is going to cause what? Like, let's talk about how that mechanically leads to heparin resistance. Well, I don't think it does. Yeah, I don't but know. But it, it showed in the study, though. Yeah, uh, they made that some. The, no, I think that the section, the chronic dissection does, but I think that more has to do with a chronic dissection having a, an inflammatory, being an inflammatory stimulator. Exactly. Mm -hmm. To the overall milieu, to the patient's whole being. Because they... Uh, because that's a real weird... You know, chronic dissections are, you know, are problematic. They're, they, they create stress, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. you know, in, in terms of an, an inflammatory stress, you know, on the body. And they were very... Uh, 
uh, sure to point out that it was not acute, um, mm -hmm. that it was only with the chronic. Here, let's see if I can find uh, categories of disease that required surgical, uh, or, yeah, okay, the proportion of aortic disease was high in both groups, but there were significantly more patients with chronic in the heparin resistance group. And uh, let's see. Uh, the percentage of the acute uh, aortic dissection in uh, non-dissection cases, such as dilation and others, did not differ significantly between the groups. So it's only with the mm -hmm. chronic. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I don't think it has to do with flow characteristics. I think it has to do with just that particular issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, well, yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, cor cardiovascular disease, coronary, coronary disease, peripheral vascular disease is an inflammatory process. Sure, all the time. You know? And uh, so I think that's Can I a, interrupt you for one second? Because I, uh, yes. I underlined something here that I think, it, since you brought this up, is worth mentioning that the chronic dissections sometimes cause coagulation abnormalities due to thrombus formation in the false lumen, which results in the, um, which results in DIC. And a consumptive coagulopathy. Right, and so that's what they said, that it may uh, end up consuming all the AT3, which would then go, make yeah. them heparin resistant. Yeah. yeah. But... That's, con that's, that's actually, and I don't, not to be critical of you, but that seems a bit, a bit um, uh, contradictory since they said AT, low AT3 levels was really not as significant a factor. Well, I think what they're saying is it is a significant factor, but some people, depending on their other preoperative uh, conditions, can overcome that. I think that's what they were saying is that we can't just use that as a predictor alone because mm. or the heparin alone because you saw many of their patients averaged four days on heparin preoperative mm -hmm. and they had no issues whatsoever and actually um, where I used to practice before coming to HET we had a surgeon that if the patient was on heparin at all preoperatively we were to have AT3 available in the room before we even started the case mm -hmm. because he had seen some problems with that. Mm -hmm. Now the majority. And you're talking about the recombinant. Yeah, thrombate. Thrombate, yeah. Um, but most of the time we didn't use it. Now were we happy when we had it in the room because starting that whole process with pharmacy when you're ready to go on bypass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always. A it big takes deal. a long time. <laughs> yes. But um, I think in the past that's what people most of the time they're not getting their AT3 levels read before, uh, you know going in for heart surgery. It's just not a normal thing that I had found any data on. So we were using the heparin, preoperative heparin, as a predictor alone. So maybe mm -hmm. that's what they're saying with the AT3 levels is it can be a problem in combination with other things. Yes, that makes sense to me too, actually. It makes a lot of sense. Um, Hold on, I'm going to go on mm -hmm. here. So I wanted to talk about a little bit, if I may uh, just kind of divert and talk about our anticoagulation. Yes. And uh, what, what standards we have. Because I know there's some variability out there in what people do. You know, what's your minimum ACT? What are you looking for? Is everyone still going for, you know, 480? Or uh, are you accepting 400 when you're on bypass and yet you, you know, you come back with a 390? Are you accepting that? Are you treating that? So we've talked about this kind of off camera before that there's uh, actually not a standard that is universal within the perfusion community. So mm -hmm. the only thing I could find uh, that even addresses <coughs> this topic directly with perfusion was the AMSEC standards, but you can see that it doesn't give an actual number. It says, you know, what is suitable. And uh, I thought it was worth just mentioning, even uh, American Boards doesn't have anything on that. Mm -hmm. um, and the only other thing I could find was um, there was a study done, uh, a clinical practice, I guess, guidelines, uh, literature search, and um, this is what uh, the STS came up with. They had a class one recommendation um, that actually, um, you know, just says you do need to monitor it. And um, then the class two, it talks about how to um, bolus and what we should be going for 480. However, depending on the types of machine, that's just a, a, n a number is right. what they're saying. Right. And it, um, right. 
even something with 400, if you're, you find that your machine is, uh, what do they call it, maximally activated clotting, um, then you can go with something as low as 400. So I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting. No, I think that is interesting, and I think you're 100% right. I think that technologies, there is tremendous technological variability. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not every machine really correlates. No, it doesn't. And, uh, I was a part of a correlation study uh, previously when we were trying to go to a new machine, and but we were still going to have some of the old machines, you know, mm -hmm. how it is, budget. You, you get a new machine for this room, but the other two still have to have the old machine still mm -hmm. next budget. And so we did correlation studies, and um, you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, at the variability. I mean, it, no, I, I wouldn't be surprised because I've done a, I've done a lot of those. I've done a lot of consulting with companies that do um, ACTs and other laboratory type stuff, looking at that very thing. So I'm very well aware of how wide the variability can be. I think what's important about those is not necessarily the number, but knowing your machine is a lower ACT type machine or a higher one. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we found is that our newer machine right. was going to be one that always showed the ACT just a bit higher than our older machine. And so when you were in the room with that one, you know, you didn't worry too much if you had a 450 because you know on your other ACT machine that you'd been using for years, it would have probably given you a higher, you know, uh, over 500 kind mm -hmm. of Things. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I think though, that's reasonable. So even though there's been, you know, there's a wide variability between kinds of machines, so mm -hmm. this kind of a study would be hard to do, but if you did it all with one machine, are either of you aware of a study that, that studies the difference between 400 and 480 and related to post-operative bleeding? No. I'm not, but it would be a good study. That would be a good study. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of other variables that contribute to well, and even, bleeding, so maybe mm -hmm. not. And, and even just the, um, I think it would be interesting to uh, study that in conjunction with uh, the amount of heparin uh, given to particular patients to achieve your specific number. Mm -hmm. You know, and that ha would mm -hmm. have to, a lot to do with, you know, sometimes we get those heparin lots that just... Yeah, that happened recently. <laughs> They're not very effective. They I did. Oh, I know. Yeah. That just happened we were to us. We pouring heparin in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and that's happened to me everybody. in the past. And you yeah. needed to get a new lot. Yeah, you had to yeah. get a new lot. That mm -hmm. hap that's happened to me in the past before, too. Um, but I, I think that would all be very interesting. Um, they do talk about that weight-based is, you know, what is uh, recommended or common practice. You need the slides up? Uh, no, not yet. No, it's, okay. it's kind of in there in their okay. uh, class too, but uh, that they found, I didn't put this one there, it was their class three recommendation that uh, people who use the, you know, the machines that measure heparin sensitivity and levels instead of the ACT. Yeah, like the Medtronic. Exactly. Yeah. That um, although those may be more specific, they did not find them necessarily to be more effective. Mm -hmm. HMS. Mm -hmm. yeah, HMS. Yeah, HMS. Yeah, it's I been a while. For a while. I haven't yeah. seen those in a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so here. Oh, they're still around. They're still around. No, I, There's I, a lot of people that I know that people use, use them. And they are, when they use the, like, the, I mean, there are people that just think that's the only way you should ever do this. Well, when I first yeah. became a perfusionist, the hospital that I was at, we used it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was great, but the problem, I think, especially the more you don't have a hospital necessarily that you're working at that's a high volume hospital mm -hmm. is just being able to keep up with all the expiration dates and controls and the different cartridges that you need right. makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, that particular place that I was working was a mid-level, but busy enough that we were able to uh, you know, be able to get through the cartridges before the expiration because that really starts to be a budget problem mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, agree. No, it's very, it's a very, exp it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that HMS system. Is, in fact, all of this stuff, all of these POC mm -hmm. uh, laboratory tests are incredibly expensive, and for the most part, tremendously labor intensive. Mm -hmm. You know, the the amount of, you know, the QCs and the all the other things that you have to do, the 
the competency testings, but the QCs alone. Well, and the fact that it has to be the end user, so that means us. You know, the, yes. the lab uh, is not doing it for you. Mm -hmm. You know, at the recommendation of CAP. I don't know how that all happened. I really don't. That, I mean, it I, didn't used to be that way I that to, I remember. No, and I used to work places uh, in the past, you know, historically, um, where they actually had a POC laboratory section in the operating room, and they would have a an actual certified trained, mm -hmm. yeah. certified mm -hmm. laboratory technician yeah. who you would give the sample to, yeah. the, you know, you'd label like it. Like a med so tech forth. person. Yes, right. and yep. they would run it yeah. mm -hmm. and then bring you the results. Yeah. And they would do that for all of the, you know, heart rooms. Because at the time, we, I think we were operating with uh, uh, six heart rooms. Mm -hmm. And so at the time. So when I worked in Las Vegas, there was uh, somebody who had, that was a business. They had a cart. They were certified. They had all kinds of tests that they could do, and they would wheel it around. They'd just be on call all day, 24 hours, and they'd wheel from room to room and do any kind of test you wanted. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was interesting. Well, yeah, that's really smart. And save the money for the hospital, too. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. yeah. smart. At Texas Heart, we did our own ACTs when I was a student, mm -hmm. but as far as your ABGs, you were sending those out, and mm -hmm. I, they went to, like, a, a lab tech person mm -hmm. who just, or maybe it was a respiratory therapist, actually, I don't know, but I, I had thought it was a lab tech person that just, you know, that was, they were waiting for you. They did so many hearts at the time mm -hmm. that that was someone's full-time job. Full-time job, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, there's some, there's a lot of convenience, I think, to having, um, you know, being able to run your own blood gas, to be able to do all of that stuff, and you know, reg the regulatory portion of this is what gets complicated because, you know, again, we're, you know, right now especially, I mean, and I really don't want to change the topic from what this topic is, but COVID has really, has very much revealed, you know, this uptick, kind of like what H1N1 did similarly. But I think, you know, I used to say that this was not as bad because H1N1 was pretty horrible for us. Um, but I'm starting to think that it's either equal to now or maybe even getting a little worse. I'm not 100% sure yet um, in the final analysis. But uh, it certainly has revealed the limitations of human assets, whether it be perfusionists, whether it be physicians, whether it be nurses, whether it be respiratory therapists, not just the technology. like ventilators mm -hmm. you know as they call them up in new york ventilator i don't know how you, i can't even say it the way that guy says it but um <laughs> you know not just the technology but you know ecmo uh, uh platforms mm -hmm. ecmo platforms are you know like the, the, that's a resource too okay mm -hmm. we had we you know we just recently had a person on the heart lung machine we used the whole heart lung machine and transported the patient you know on that whole heart lung machine on ECMO just for the purpose of ECMO. It wasn't a post cardiotomy. It wasn't a heart that we mm -hmm. had transitioned to ECMO. This is a, just a VV ECMO. Move them from one place to another. That was a VA actually. Mm -hmm. um, one from the operating room to, uh, to the ICU and kept them on it for, you know, stuffed it in that, big, in that room. Thank God the room was big enough. Yeah, thank goodness but the room I mean, was big. technology, but human assets is really, uh, I think it is revealed the limitations that we have as a profession. And I don't think we're unique. I think that's just the way medicine is. Mm -hmm. We operate at a very, you know, at a, on a very thin margin. Blood transfusions, I just gave a talk the other, the other night. We used 98% of the donated blood, of Ooh. the available blood supply, we used 98% of it. So the wow. amount left over is very thin from acquired to needed. Yeah, I've been and getting emails, I think, almost every day asking me to give blood. Yes, a very, very, very thin margin. Mm -hmm. So the nation's blood supply operates. So any, now, when COVID happened, um, interestingly enough, there was a surge of people that actually went and donated because there was such fear. And they canceled a lot of blood drives, but mm -hmm. they realized that uh, we can't be canceling blood drives. Right. We got to figure out how to do this. And people, that's the thing about society. Our society happened in the UK as well, happened in places in Europe as well. Um, people will step up mm -hmm. and do what needs to be done. Um, so they ended up actually almost having a surplus for a, 
a period of time, but then it dropped back off again. So we're right at about 98%. What, mm -hmm. we, what we acquire right. or get from donations and for what we uh, transfuse. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Any more comments on that? No. Okay, so well, mm -hmm. just, I, just, I, do you have something? I, well, I do a little bit. Um, do you still advocate because thrombate is very expensive. Okay, so actually we're I'm moving right into oh, that. So good. we're ready to go on bypass and we have a low AC. Now what are we gonna do? Oh, okay, good. Okay, and I thought this was a real cute cartoon. Uh, talking about, we have to remember that, you know, heparin doesn't have any direct anticoagulant uh, effect. It binds to AT3, so therefore it needs AT3. Mm -hmm. And that's how it's going to uh, do its job is inhibit thrombin and, uh, you know, activated factor X. You see our little thrombin is tied up and he can't help the fibrin. Uh, that is cute. But okay. You Where'd that's, you get that? Cool. Yeah, you like, uh, I <laughs> found it on Pinterest, if you can believe that. I believe it. Someone has a, <laughs> has a Pinterest board about it. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, of course, here's just a real simple um, mechanism of action for heparin and how it works. And... Um, knowing that it, you know, it actually changes uh, the, it's a conformational change for the AT3 and it, it's a, a, you know, it's a permanent change uh, when it forms that complex. Okay, so we're ready to go on bypass. Our ACT is 350. What are we gonna do? Well, you can get more heparin and a lot of hospitals have protocols that you have to give an enormous amount of heparin before they're going to release you know, whatever they have, whether it be AT3 or this new one, Atrin, I guess, which is recombinant AT3 from huh. goats, I believe. Oh, okay. I don't know anything about it. Yeah. It's, it's newer. Uh, I don't know how long it's been on the market, but I, I've only learned about it uh, a short time ago. Um, and, you know, of course, everyone, it used to be FFP was quick and easy to get. Just go ahead and get the FFP. But it seems like with these... Um, it, I always say blood conservation. You don't like that. What's the word you like to Transfusion use? Transfusion management. Transfusion management protocols that a lot of hospitals have and doctors are following. You know, they're they're hesitant to do that if we have other ways. You know, around that. Um, so, first off, more heparin. Usually, this is the way I saw it in my practice. Then we'd give the uh, thrombate if needed. And uh, if the thrombate wasn't available or we had a problem with getting it from the pharmacy, because it's very expensive, and especially yeah. if you're in a smaller institution and you haven't prearranged for it, they're not going to have it. Mm -hmm. uh, then we would give FFP. I didn't know if there were any other techniques or things out there that you've seen done to get the ACT up. I, had, I don't know of any. Yeah, I've canceled cases because we couldn't get <coughs> I've, I've seen where well, I, I haven't personally canceled them, but I have been involved in cases where the case was canceled, mm -hmm. the medical decision to cancel the case was made uh, because we were unable to get the ACT up, I mean, actually a few times. Mm -hmm. That was after FFP? That was, at, no, that was, we didn't give FFP and we didn't give, they didn't want to give FFP and we didn't have thrombate and the heparin was given and the ACT went from let's say 120 to 125. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, uh, what happened there? And then we tried something else and tried, you know, like a different lot and yeah. gave another, you know, 10,000, didn't move, gave another full dose, didn't move. And it was like, you know, uh, we're not, you know, how much FFP would we have to give to do this? I think the decision just was there's something wrong here. Something wrong. We're just going to not do this. And the problem is, is that you're your chest is open. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's it's I mean, it's the worst open. possible time to figure out that you can't yeah, do this right. surgery. Right. And imagine being the patient waking up and yeah. saying, "Oh, I went through all that and mm -hmm. right, and I still <laughs> didn't even get my heart fixed." Right. Now, how much heparin have you seen given when the the plan is let's just give not just a little more heparin. I'm not talking like let's yeah. give, you know, right. 5,000 5, more or something. I've seen three three full doses was probably the most I've ever seen and it it was it was unsettling to me. Um, we had had a pharmacist uh, previously who minimum don't call me for the thrombate until you've given uh, sixty thousand of heparin. And it's a lot, you know. Well, that's not really. That, I mean, not at the doses. Depends there, on the that's size. Two doses. Yeah, right. yeah, I guess. Mm -hmm. But it's. I think it's a lot. I think 
especially it we, is a lot. We I had thrombate available mm -hmm. in this hospital, yeah. and we didn't. You weren't going to ask for it if you didn't need it. That's another right. thing. My question is. It's not like you, you were l luxuriously saying, let's just give thrombate, you know? Right, but here's the thing I would ask is, let's say, in, like in the case where I gave three, two, you know, I mean, 60,000 is a lot, but, you know, we are already given 30, so that is a lot, but then you give the thrombate. Mm -hmm. And all 60,000 units now, or 90,000 units, or 80,000 units, or whatever, they all work. Activates. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. You, you know see that, it's right? still going to have a ninety-minute half-life, right? right? Right. That's the whole point of, that I'm making. You just gave, let's say, most people get around you know twenty to thirty thousand. You've given at least a double dose for sixty thousand, right? And you didn't get an effect, or you wouldn't be still asking for the thrombate. Now you give the thrombate, and your first ACT on pump nine is, nine nine. Well, right. I had an old machine, so greater than fifteen hundred. Ah. That's how far it read, yeah. and. That's a lot. Did it reverse wow. though? It reversed, but you, I mean, in those situations, if you have a fast surgeon, you know, you're coming off what well, you're, yeah. you know, you're still like a thousand for your mm -hmm. ACT. Right. And then you worry about over reversing because you've just done graphs, so you don't want to clot those graphs off. So, yeah. You think? It's a thing. You think that could happen? I thought given too much, I, mean, I thought uh, protamine, protamine would give you bleeding. You yeah, know, I thought so. protamine was in it self an anticoagulant i don't know i don't think you could over reverse i don't think so i'm not sure about that one okay so why do we i'm not, well, sure, well, I'm not I, sure about this that. could be a debate on its own because yeah. how would we even like <laughs> I, why do we even calculate a protamine well i guess the reason we calculate a protamine dose those who of us who do i don't but i mean the anesthesiologists yeah. in our group do is because I they don't want it. to give too much i just make it up oh you you give them a number I mean, sometimes they ask there's for a, it. Yeah, sure. Sometimes, uh, yeah. but ask anyway, for it. I mean, yeah. if they give too much, they are probably concerned about bleeding. Yeah, about bleeding. Right. Right. Not hypercoagulability. Uh, I don't think that. I don't know. I mean, look, that's the next. Okay, right okay. at the top. That's of the next. Yeah. Right, right, <laughs> right, right at that. Just we may as well do this, okay? <laughs> you know, because we each have an opinion which is different. I don't so, have an educated opinion. I just know that that has been said. You better have an educated opinion. In my you presence. You are educated, the last I checked. But not about that particular topic. That, okay. That I just go with what said. people well, told me. That's yeah. our next research project. <laughs> if anybody knows, you can send in a, a comment. Yeah. Um, okay, good. Okay. So next. Yeah, no, that's actually all I got. So that's it? We're it. That's okay, it. So good. any more discussion on this? Yeah, I think it's a good topic. Um, I think we all see it. Um, I'm not I'm maybe a little more surprised with the number of patients. The percentage was higher than what I see than what I see clinically. Well, and uh, I, I think this is a limited study. It's only at you know it, they had a, a, a large number for mm -hmm. one uh, single you know facility, but it is still just a single facility. And sometimes you know things are population driven in yes, where you I was, are. I was wondering about that. Yeah. You know, is there something dietary in yeah. Japan or Could genetically in, uh, or, in, yeah. in that, that Asian group that, uh, that, that makes them maybe more have a higher uh, propensity for heparin exactly. resistance? I mean, that's because, I mean, there are things like that to occur, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Racial, racial uh, uh, discrepant or Racial, what's the word I'm looking for? Commonalities, I don't know. Yeah, something like that, mm -hmm. where you, you have that happen. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Well, that was good. Thank yeah. you very much. Well, I enjoyed it. Our second, uh, no, this is our third. Third. Third, because you did one. That's right. Our third, yeah, thank God you were here. Our third <laughs> Tammy Sparacino <laughs> Journal Club is concluded. We'll go on to the next topic. The next topic is uh, our Morbidity and Mortality Conference. So we can, I guess, jump right into that if you'd like to. Yeah. And then we're going to be finishing up with Patrick on his update on scavenging your anesthetic gas, which is going to be very good. I, I really am looking forward to seeing that. So let me pull up my slides here and also there. It's going to be a lot easier for me to, re to view them here. Okay, and then a clicker. Clicker. Okay, so um, there is a the copy of the patient's um, cover sheet. Uh, it's a 53 year old female. She's 168 centimeters, 58 kilograms. Her baseline H and H is 44 
and 15, which is great. Um, she uh, has a platelet count of 176,000. Her WBC is 8.7. Uh, electrolytes and renal function appear quite normal. So she was really, you know, she was 50, you know, young um, and uh, looked like she was doing pretty doggone well uh, physiologically. Uh, I'll probably have to come back to this because I have a few things circled, but if you look down towards the bottom of it, you see uh, that her initial heparin dose was 30,000. Uh, she, uh, we didn't have any issues with ACTs, but you see two circa rest times. One is approximately two minutes, and the other one is uh, 21 minutes, giving a combined 23 minutes, which mm -hmm. we'll address as we move forward with this. Uh, they did wrap. Um, they primed with 1,500 plus 100 of albumin, uh, some mannitol, uh, heparin, bicarb, and then wrapped 500, giving them a net prime. It says 1,000, but really the net prime was, uh, I guess, 1,170 would be a more accurate number. But, you know, I think that's, that, that, that doesn't really make any difference. It's not necessarily germane to the, uh, to the uh, presentation. History on this uh, patient continued is she had a previous type 1 aortic dissection repair with an aortic valve replacement at the time. It was done uh, several years before this uh, procedure, and it was at a different institution. In that institution, they cooled her to 14 degrees and just cooled circulatory arrest, so profound hypothermia, circulatory arrest, no selective uh, or isolated cerebral perfusion, she uh, had a full recovery. However, her course was complicated from uh, coagulopathy. Now that, you know, could have been due to a whole variety of factors. Some people say it was, you know, because of the cooling or that degree of hypothermia. I really don't believe that, that, that I think that can contribute, but I think that's easily overcomable. I think the coagulopathy was probably from something else. <laughs> um, she now has an ascending aortic pseudoaneurysm. And there is plan to repair this with a possible coronary bypass uh, utilizing, and, and the way it was ordered, or the way it was consulted, the way it was written was deep hypothermia and circulatory arrest. Okay. So, uh, hey, um, Magic. Yeah. Really? What are we doing? No. no, can we just, no, that's not, no, can we just not do the screen and screen like normal because I'm doing a whole presentation on this. Okay. Okay, um, the plan is to uh, uh, repair with the uh, coronary bypass. And let me wait until we've got the things set up. You want a split screen? Is that what you're... Yeah. He wants us up there as okay. well as that. Yeah, that's what I want. Not just me, though, if you don't mind. Just the whole group. I liked it the way it was. Like our old way of doing it. Well, while we're waiting, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. why do you think, I was going to write this down for later, but why do you think these patients, because I commonly see them bleed after we do deep hypothermic you know, procedures, why do you think they bleed? Yeah, I think it has. Uh, I think it has more to do with um, with you give a lot of fluid. I think your pump run is longer. I think that uh, there's usually a lot of cell saver, cell salvage suction, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that you know there's. I think it's just a combination of over dilution um, and uh, not getting you know certain things tuned up before you come off and what I've found is when you come off pump in a circumstance like that where it's been a long case you've had a lot of blood run through the cell saver you've lost a lot of products that way of course it's good for the red cells but nothing else you have a lot of pump suction that's been going True, yeah. on 
um, which is really very deleterious to the, to the blood and to the clotting factors. Um, and so I think when you come off, then you're really juicy and you're bleeding kind of from everywhere. And then you're replacing that because you need to do it for pressure. And then you start chasing it. And you end up basically in a spiral where you're just chasing your tail. They're bleeding and you're replacing. They're bleeding and you're replacing. Right. I think that in those cases, the ones that I've done that I've had the most success with have been where you get warm and you have to be globally warm. You can't just... Mm -hmm. You, you know, rushing rewarming is bad for a whole bunch mm. of things. But one of the things it's really bad for is avoiding, when you go too fast, you have rebound cooling. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in cold blood, don't clot, right? Mm -hmm. We all heard, we've heard that before. So the patient drifts back down to 35.5, 35.4, and you're wondering why are we having bleeding problems? Well, that's probably the reason. So I like to get warm, stay warm for a period of time to make sure that I am globally warm in the deep tissue so I'm not going to have that rebound effect. And then either do a tag mm -hmm. or, you know, check the labs, do a, you know, do a, uh, do a, do a PT, you know, not a PTT, but do a PT, mm -hmm. do a fibrinogen, do a platelet count, um, check those various things. And then give those products mm -hmm. before you come off. I don't like to wait until I'm off to give them. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, why are you gonna give all of that while you're on pump? It's gonna just be in the pump. It's gonna all be consumed by the pump. Well, if that was true, then every single case we did would need massive amounts of transfusions, and they don't. We do mm -hmm. most of our cases with no transfusions at all. So. I don't think that really is the case. I think when you first go on pump, I think you have a certain level of thrombocytopenia that occurs by getting adhered to various mm -hmm. surfaces. I do think that happens until you get that first plasma layer down. Mm -hmm. But then I think that really stops. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that, that w that's what happens. The pump doesn't consume platelets. It really doesn't do that. At first, yes. The first yeah, the pass, initial. Yes, the initial drop. But then that's, that's over with. So when you give platelets, because we do it on patients that are on ECMO. Like I've heard people say, oh my God, you're gonna give platelets into the ECMO, okay? Well, but if I give them really fast through that central line, it's all coming to me. Mm -hmm. It's gonna come to me anyway. So I don't really, I've never I, understood that. I think the thought with that is, is they're, not, they're thinking that some of them are gonna get hung up in the oxygenator, but I've given platelets when I first started doing ECMO, you know, I did neonate uh, and pediatric, and we gave platelets through the um, circuit all the yes. time, just post-oxygenator. Now, do you have to be careful? Oh, I'd give it pre-oxygenator. Well, I that's give tough it to do, too. Yeah. Post-oxygenator? Always yeah. gave it post-oxygenator. I wouldn't do that. I would give it pre-oxygenator. Well, but the idea, I mean, I the idea is, especially with the, the babies, you know, you're giving such a small amount. Yes, you want to make right. sure it all of it makes it through at least one pass through them before it's coming back through your circuit. Yeah, but again, you know, and that's very good. I mean, listen, I, 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 it's another debate for another day. Mm -hmm. I do get it. And I mean, that's the, that's but the I think beauty you, of these But I think programs. that's what people are thinking is yes, that it's getting it's, hung up in the oxygen. I've thought if you put them pre-oxygenator that you are going, I guess I was just told this, I've never really yeah. studied it, but you know that some of these platelets are going to first pass through the oxygenator before they hit the patient and some of them will stay there. And, some, uh, and get activated, I think, is the, the thought, too, right? It's going to get activated. But well, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. But, I mean, I think that's the thinking, right? Yeah. Because I mean, be I've the, been told that as well. It may right. be the thinking, but for me, anyway, if, if, if the oxygenator is what is consuming the platelets, then every, uh, you know, you're on ECMO for 24-7, right? Yeah. You would, everyone would be, every, you would lose all of your platelets Right. All of the time, and we don't we don't see that. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have some level of stability. They're usually losing their platelets because of some other reason. Mm -hmm. You know, generally not that at that point in time. So, for me, it doesn't make intuitive. It doesn't make sense to me um, because you've probably. I guess I would say maybe you've already you've gone on. You've laid down that layer of proteins and right. platelets, mm -hmm. and you're not going to really lay down any more after that. Well, I mean, if you if you just think of it this way, if that, that was going to happen, yeah. 
then all day long, your platelet count should just do this right. constantly. Yeah. You know, it doesn't, it's just, you know, again, right. that's my, that's my opinion and that's how I do things. Um, but with that said, uh, I don't remember what the point was originally. However, let's just get back to the case. But one point here, we should. Oh, we talked about coagulopathy while we were waiting for oh, them. Oh, coagulopathy. Yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think temperature alone. I think temperature, if you're cold, will make you coagulopathic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think if you become, if you make the patient cold, deep hypothermia, and warm them back up completely, and you correct any coagulation derangement that exists because of other reasons that, and you, and you have good surgical uh, hemostasis, that th those patients don't bleed more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they were cold. Mm -hmm. Well, we have so many patients right now on ECMO because of COVID. Wouldn't it be kind of interesting, I'm just gonna do this, is record um, when we do an oxygenator change out if we have a, a platelet count drop. There might be. I would expect you to. Yeah. Yeah. I would think you would. So that would be a number. But, it, right? but yeah, it would be interesting yes. since we have so many going yeah. at once to compare those numbers and see is it a 10% drop? Is yeah. it what is it? Yes. And, and how much does it vary? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great. I action. think that's a really good idea. Yeah, I think you should write that down yeah. so you don't forget it. And I oh, well, think we should absolutely yeah. do that. I think Actually, we should that's too. a very good idea. Because we have the opportunity right now with right. all the patients right. we have. Mm -hmm. Well, and we could even do it uh, retrospectively well, if we wanted to because. We yeah. always write down when we do an oxygenator change out, and it would be but easy to, to access. Yeah, it yeah. would be, but it'd be nice to do it like right before and right after. Sure. Like right before, yeah. or like, yes. Know, okay, we're going to change Immediately. this oxygenator, draw the lab, change it, get reestablished, wait maybe an hour, mm -hmm. draw it again. Yeah, that's a great mm -hmm. idea. You know, that would be kind of a, that would be a really good idea. Okay, so um, let's see where are we at here. So here is the first page of the flow sheet. And what you see here is that the, they went on emergent bypass uh, at 10-12. So this was an elective procedure. Something happened intraoperatively and they ended up crashing on pump. And the first, and I say insult, but I don't necessarily mean it in a derogatory way, occurred at 1056. They went to a flow of 500 mLs per minute for two minutes, and then they went to circa rest for two minutes. Now that's a combined four minutes, but at 30 degrees, which is what the temperature was at the time, according to the, um, you know, the data that I'm gonna show you, the, the various different, uh, 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 parameters that less than 10 minutes, you know, you should be okay. So it was four minutes at 30 degrees. Can I ask where are we 30 degrees? What's the, I can't quite so, see. Okay. Is it so bladder? You, where are we you, reading this? Yeah, that's a very good question. And thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Let me get this to work. So if you, I have my glasses on, hold on. I've even see. got my glasses on and I can't see. It. I know. Um, it is right up here you have right there, temps. Okay. You have venous, bladder, bladder. Okay. and esophageal. And the at the time this occurred, you have uh, 1056, you have 30 degrees on the um, venous, 31 on the bladder, and 30 degrees on the esophageal. So, you know, that's, that's probably okay. You know, I don't see any issue with that. And if at the same time, which I'm sorry, you can't see from here, I apologize, I have it on here. But if you look at it, you will see that the uh, cerebral oximetry numbers actually stayed pretty stable, 67 and 72, uh, 58 and 58, 70 and 81. So the cerebral oximetry numbers at this point we're doing pretty good. So 1056 flow to 500 and then flow to full flow at 11 o'clock. Now it brings up an issue for me and that is, is a flow of 500 cc's circulatory arrest? Where was or, the flow going directly? Well, so the aorta. aorta. The aorta. Okay. Yeah, this just for standard, standard yeah. cannulation. At 30 degrees? Not for very long, I would guess. But it's 500 cc's 
a neg is that negligible flow in which case it's no better than no flow or are you going to get some benefit from 500 cc's cannulated i guess really in the anomaly yeah i don't know that seems pretty pretty patient negligible patient size is what 1.8 mm -hmm. to 3 was the bsa yeah the bsa so, was like 1.6 something like that it was so uh, that's a cardiac index of like less than the bsa was 1.68 is my guess yeah, yeah. so I don't think it really no, has. I, I think it basically is four minutes of circa rest. Yeah. yeah That's kind of how I view it. I can't even. I mean, I assume they're on a centrifugal pump. Do you know? Yes. It was a centrifugal pump. It's pretty hard to be around 500 cc's and have enough RPMs to really flow, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. Also, did you have a venous saturation? Um, yes, there is oh, a venous a saturation, and actually the SVO2 was never recorded during that period of time below 95. Really? So, yeah. you know, do you, you know. Was so there it, was very little metabolism. Anyway. Well, they just might not have. Or maybe it hadn't calibrated yet. You know how it is. Right. You're going on emergently. You've got to do your little thing right. to that. Yeah, in four minutes, can you really can expect you see? there to be a change? Yeah. You know, probably not. So let's look at another, another right. thing. So the second sheet is where the excitement actually happens. And there's a lot, I wish I had it for you to look at. I'm sorry that it's so small up on the screen. Hopefully the people at home can see it. Um, I'm assuming they can. But in this case, they continued to cool after going back on pump and they cooled to 27 degrees. At the time of the beginning of circa rest, they were, their temperatures were 27, 27, 27, and 26, 26, 27, 27. So 27, 27, 27, and 26, 27, 27. Venous bladder and, uh, and uh, blood temperature. They were on circa rest for a total of 21 minutes. Now, is it really a total of 21, or is it 23, or is it 27 based on the yeah. chart? Um, Less than 30, though, you could definitely say. Less than 30, yes. But it was so, I'm just going to say it was 21 minutes because I think there are two isolated events that were far enough apart that it's just one event. Okay. Um, there were very low nears. Uh, they were using the somnetics following restoration of flow. And I know you can't see that, but I'll tell you what they were. Following restoration for approximately an hour. It was 57 to 59 on one side and 30 to uh, 34 on the other side. So pretty low numbers. And I think 55 is like a threshold. And it never came up above 46 on the, uh, on the uh, uh, right side, but it uh, went to 61 on the left side. Okay. So, what was the outcome? Well, this EEG showed when the patient didn't wake up, uh, did fine hemodynamically, but profound uh, depression was seen on EEG. CT of the head showed a diffuse stroke yeah. and uh, significant cerebral edema uh -huh. and ultimately diagnosed with brain death. So mm -hmm. this patient died uh, from what appeared to be anoxic brain injury. Mm -hmm. okay. So why did it happen? So I have some observations. My first observation, and again, you didn't have the chart to look at, but just, you know, if you don't mind, give me the liberty of just sure. sort of telling you what I observed myself. One, I think that both the cooling time and the cooling depth were absolutely inadequate for a patient that is going to be going under 21 minutes of circulatory arrest. Especially with no cerebral perfusion. None. No, no yeah. selective cerebral perfusion so what, whatsoever. Not antegrade, not retrograde, not trickle flow, not nothing. What was there the was cooling nothing. time again? Cooling time? The cooling time was less than an hour. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a lot less than an hour because they, they only, only went to 27 yeah. degrees. Right. Yeah, it was, 
it was relatively short, but it was because they had some issues at the beginning, and so right. they were sort of working through all those issues, and they went back on pump after that first circulatory arrest at 30 degrees and continued to cool. But it was so it was fairly quick. The whole episode took probably from start to finish less than an hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the warming time, even though, and I'll go through the parameters or I'll go through the guidelines rather, by mm -hmm. the more appropriate, um, I feel was way too short. Yeah, because it was only what twenty five minutes. Is that Ten correct? Minutes. No warming, rewarming. Yeah. No, I'll go. I'll go over the time. I'll go over the time with you. It was longer than that. Oh, okay. Um, the uh, 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 the uh, uh, CCP. I forgot what it wrote. I forgot what that was. Swap it. Start the circulatory. Oh, they oh, changed the perfusionist. Yeah, yeah. Perf yeah Thank you. Yeah. The perfusionist swapped at the start of circulatory arrest. So perfusionist A started the case. Perfusionist B took over the case at the beginning of circulatory arrest. Mm -hmm. The initial or after the the first little mini the, one. No, the the major one, the big okay. one. Um, cooling temp, as I said, I felt was inadequate. There was a lack of selective cerebral perfusion, which I thought was misguided. Uh, the nears during rewarming was never addressed at full flow. And what is, how do you interpret what deep hypothermia circulatory rest is? So if you say, if the, if the, if the surgeon in charge says, Tammy, I want to do deep hypothermia circulatory arrest, and I'm not going to do any cerebral perfusion. How are you going to interpret that? So let me just ask you that question. How are you, how are you either of you going to? I need, you need to cool until there's no brain activity. Ah. And if you don't, if you're not at a facility that monitors EEG, then you're just going to have to go with what the published numbers are. And that's. 18. The, yeah, 18, 18. is the, um, is the maximum temperature. And sometimes people even cool to 15. Yes. So 15 yes. to 18 is your range if you're not monitoring EEG. Now, um, I did get to do a few cases when I was a student where they did a lot of this with a very you know, experienced surgeon who this was his thing, it's what mm -hmm. he did, and they monitored EEG. We still cooled to 18, but you got to see when the brain activity fell mm -hmm. off. Yes. Often it was below, around 20 and, you know, a little below that, mm -hmm. but 18 is protective and 15, especially if you're completely in the dark, should be completely protective. But I think people don't do that because they think they're going to be real quick. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, I'm just got to do this one thing. Mm -hmm. But you never know because things can go right. wrong, right? Ah, things can go wrong, <laughs> yes. And so you could be there longer. When it all goes wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And they don't Best want... Best laid plans of mice and men. They don't want to... Um, and I'm not speaking of the perfusionist. This could be the surgeon. This could be whomever. Well, so don't, usually the surgeon. Right. Don't want to uh, have that slow warming time. I mean, right. it mm -hmm. would take longer most times to do the warming than it did to do the actual procedure that yes. went well. Yes. But you did see the outcome, right? Yeah. No, I saw the outcome. Okay. So if I say to you, if, if surgeon you work with says to you, Patrick, I want deep hypothermia circulatory arrest. How do you interpret that? What does that mean to you as a temperature? Okay, well, I have the numbers in my head the same as Tammy did, but I also, the first thing I say is how cold. Mm hmm Okay. I would says, want to leave it in the surgeon's hands. Okay, and he says 27. Okay, then I'd say I think, you know, we've got to go colder because if you're going to take I don't want to go colder, Patrick. Mm. <laughs> that's tough. Wow, that's a tough question, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, then What I, would you say are you going to do? What would be need, another question? You, you, you can we do some type of cerebral perfusion? No. I can show you how to do it. We can do it. I can show you how to do it. I've had to do that. No, I know. Well, really? Yeah. 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 But no, I'm not going to do it. Go on pump. When I tell you to turn the pump off, turn it off. Don't cool below 27 degrees. And I'll tell you when to turn the pump back on. I think you have to, I mean. What would you do? I think you get someone else involved. Like, hopefully, you know, you can get your anesthesiologist, the other doctor in the room. Totally agree with you 100%. I could not agree with you more. We have a responsibility <laughs> right. to not let somebody do something we know is not going to end well. It's, it's a hard place to be because, again, we work under the direction of doctors, and that's why... Right. You're going to have to get the other doctor involved. Yes. And sometimes doctors. Yes. Not just one, right? Not mm -hmm. just a few. Not just who's in the room. You do whatever you do. That's what I would well, do. Well, and I hopefully. I wouldn't do it. 
I, I, to be honest with you, I've made the decision that I would go ahead and lose my job. I'd quit. I'd be the end of my career, and that's fine. At that place, wouldn't be the end of my career, but yeah. I would refuse. Well, I think this is goes to a, another topic completely, but of developing relationships. Maybe you don't have a relationship with this particular surgeon. You know, obviously, if you're not able to have an open dialogue about this, you probably don't have the best uh, collaborative relationship. But that's why it's important to develop these relationships all over the hospital with your anesthesiologist, with your administrators as best you can, because sure. that's who you're going to get involved if the surgeon just well, tells you. the medical director the, yes. the, or the, the, the CME, the chief medical uh, officer, CMO. And you might not, but as a perfusionist, maybe you don't know that person, but you make as many um, connections collaboratively with these other people to help you in that type Absolutely. of situation. Absolutely, but a young perfusionist isn't going to do that. No. Hey, John. John's here. Hey, John. John. I love when John shows up. John, John Ingram, another perfusionist extraordinaire. I got, I got, I'm surrounded by perfusion extraordinaires. <laughs> um, so, Patrick, yeah. if he says to you or she says to you, the surgeon says to you, um, I want DHCA, uh, and you say, well, what temperature? And they say, I don't know, you, whatever you think is best. You just, just do whatever you need to do. Okay. Yeah, I'd, and go then to I'd go to 18. You'd go to 18. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And Patrick, just so you know, I'm going to be pretty quick with this. Probably not going to take me longer than 18 minutes. Maybe. Right. So now what are you going to do? What temperature are you going to use? I might go a little deeper than 18. Just keep cooling, really. Okay. So it's only going to be, I'm only going to be 15 minutes, Patrick. This yeah. is going to be a 15 minute anastomosis. Yeah. So less time. It's going to be fast. What temperature are you going to want to cool to? Well, uh, you know, between 15 and 18, that's where Okay, so that's yeah. it. That's yeah. your answer. Yeah. For 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. You should I'm be going, okay up to 40 minutes. You should be. And we'll talk about that. But I like your answer. Oh, I do. good. <laughs> I love your answer. <laughs> well, I think, do you? I yes. I okay. think part of the problem is... <laughs> I love is your answer. That needs to be said up front, especially with the surgeon who's asking you yeah. because it it's going to take a minute to get there and so you're going to have to be patient that's another right. thing wait till you see some of this data i got some data i got some stuff for you <laughs> i got some cool slides are you ignoring okay. john no i said hi to him okay he's going to jump in if we <laughs> yeah. can't keep john down we would have if we would have him up there as a triple uh, uh a box to the right but we don't have it okay so i'm not sure why that might be but uh, here, I'm going to get cut. Plan ahead. Exactly. Got to plan ahead. So here is the annals of thoracic surgery consensus on hypothermia classification in aortic arch surgery. And this is from the nasopharyngeal temperature. And I'll talk about the various sites and what that really mm -hmm. means, too. So mild is 28.1 to 34. Moderate, 20.1 to 28. Deep. 14.1 to 20, and profound less than four, equal or less than 14. Those are, this is from the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, uh, and this is what the consensus is, what these words mean for a number. Mm -hmm. And from what site, and that is a very important thing to re recognize what site. So here is uh, the proportion of patients for whom electrocerebral silence is achieved at a given nasopharyngeal temperature. And uh, so the proposed categories are superimposed in dark red, which you can see uh, on, the, on the graph. But if you look at the proportion of patients that have not achieved, not, and that's the key, cerebral, electrocerebral silence, you can see that 90% have not achieved it as low as 22 degrees, or 20, between 22 and 23. Mm -hmm. When you get to 18 degrees, it's still just a little more than half. It isn't until you get down to 11 degrees where you really don't see anyone that pretty much has anything. So electrocerebral activity exists even at very, very low temperatures. And I thought that was very interesting. If you're measuring, again, nasopharyngeal. Yeah. Now, this slide is 
a, a very interesting slide. It takes the same data, and if you look at the left side, and you look at it from right to left, so section A, it's still the same percentage of patients that have not mm -hmm. achieved uh, electrocerebral uh, uh, silence, okay, or inactivity, and you follow it out, you see that same graph. Now look to the right, it's the same data on the, that's the x-axis, right? Mm -hmm. On the y-axis, the minutes of cooling. Look at how much, how many minutes of cooling you need to achieve the same thing. So to achieve electrocerebral inactivity, you, to get to 100%, you have to cool for well over 90 minutes. You see it? Mm -hmm. So at the recommended temperature for at least 90 minutes is what you're it's, saying. No, you have to be cooling for 90 minutes to have a global cooling of to the patient. To get to all of the parts. Yes, all of the parts. And there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. There's a reason for everything, right? right? Which I think is fascinating. So it's not just how far you got the nasal pharyngeal temperature. Well, shouldn't it's you be me measuring long, bladder anyway? How, or rectal? Oh, well, oh, oh, that's even better. Good. Well, yeah, well, we got some good information for y'all. Because I'm pretty sure we, mm -hmm. when I observed those, gosh, this has been a long time ago, but I feel like they were rectal temperatures. Mm -hmm. I think we had multiple temperatures, mm -hmm. but I think we were mm -hmm. using rectal. Mm -hmm. Disappointingly on that one, you're going to be wrong. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You can measure it if you want to, but I'll show you what I'll show you what the data says. Okay. Um, but it's not just how cool you became; it's how long you took to get there so that you're not just crash cooling and get a nasopharyngeal temperature that's down mm -hmm. but really the deep parenchymal tissue all around it is not and that's where you start seeing these these uh, very interesting so phenomena you're saying it's the rate of cooling yeah yes the rate of cooling right yeah. if you can cool you can cool fast if you want but you have to cool for a longer period of time in other words you can get the temperature down quickly as long as you stay there. The whole thing has to do with time. So mm -hmm. you can flash cool, but then you still, if it yeah, only this, took you 15 minutes to get there, you still need another right. 40 45 minutes, minutes to, to assure, be there. Yeah. To assure, it, right, that you have right. universal cooling. Yeah. Exactly. That makes sense. Yes. So the blue is cerebral metabolic rate. The red is safe. Uh, 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 a hypothermic circulatory arrest time. And you see that it's very short when you're at normothermia, which is the red starting from right, moving left and going up. And the amount of time that you can be, uh, have a s assumed safe, estimated safe, hypothermic circulatory arrest time continues to go up as you get farther and down lower and lower on your temperature. And this is intuitive. It just makes perfectly good sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a very popular graph, uh, 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 graph. and that comes, um, again, this is out of the uh, annals of thoracic surgery. This is the one that I found the most interesting. And I'm not going to try to pick it apart. The slide's there. You guys can look at it or do whatever you want to. But let me give you the point. Because this is brain temperature at various stages of cooling, which is start, midway, circa rest time, which was 16.7 degrees, start of rewarming, end of rewarming, and midway rewarming. The, and they, they measured the tympanic, nasopharynx, pulmonary artery, esophagus, bladder, rectum, and the perfusate. Cumulative probability representation that electrocerebral silence is not achieved for temperatures that indicated, for example, at 20 degrees, 75% of the patients have not achieved ECS. ECS okay? So, Along with that, temperature variations at various sites are as compared to the brain during cerebral aneurysm repair. Each colored bar represents change compared to brain temperature at various stages of cooling. The esophageal temperature 
most closely resembles cortical temperature followed by the PA and nasopharyngeal temperature. This is the most important part of this whole slide. The rectum and bladder are considerably warmer than the brain during cooling and cooler during rewarming. While the opposite is. is true for the perfusate temperature, which is why rewarming is so incredibly dangerous. Mm. Because the opposite is true. The brain is warmer than what you're measuring as your arterial outlet flow. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. And that's why it's so dangerous. Well, I think that goes to a point of, I remember hearing a presentation years ago when I was a student about the oxygenator outlet temperature, because that was the oxygenator that we used. It mm -hmm. had the temperature right there. Um, and the brain and how, why it's so important to, even though you're in a rush to warm, just on a regular case, how warming above uh, 38 degrees, your brain is warmer than that. So yes. if you're if you're cheating and you're going to 39 with your outlet, think of what your brain is. Correct. Absolutely. Very good point. Yeah. So really, now, in, 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 in criticism of myself and that particular slide um, is that those were cerebral aneurysm repairs. The chest wasn't open. So when the chest is open, and you're using a saline, obviously, a, and you don't have flow going through your pulmonary artery, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, your PA catheter temperature and your nasopharyngeal temperature, or certainly your esophageal temperature, your esophageal temperature is likely going to be affected by the chest being open mm -hmm. and by the, uh, by the uh, uh, poor cold and all the various mm -hmm. other things that are happening at the time. So I think in that regard, but the but I'll show you that what the STS is recommended mm -hmm. recommending uh, as a class one recommendation here in just a second. Nevertheless, when I've done these cases, I always try to get them to put the probe, the uh, 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 esophageal probe, almost down into the stomach. I try to go as deep as possible. And uh, it seems to me, for me anyway, I think that gives me a little bit more comfort in that number while I'm trying to rewarm the patient being more accurate. Mm -hmm. But rectal temperature, bladder temperature, not good temperatures to measure when you're doing these kinds of procedures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So STS, I put all the recommendations there on the slide. Can I go back to that real quick? Yes. So only because of the overheating of the brain. But if you're doing it slow and measured mm -hmm. and allowing time for the bladder to catch mm -hmm. up to the mm -hmm. temperature that you want mm -hmm. it to be, you shouldn't be over warming or mm -hmm. over cooling mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. brain. I think if you want to measure all of them, mm -hmm. I think that's fine. But I think when something lags behind like that, um, it can become frustrating for everybody mm -hmm. and you start going, okay, what's wrong here? Why, are we, why is this not getting where it needs to be? And if, the, if the, the recommendations are that esophageal temperature is the one that most accurately, in fact, that's what the STS uh, recommends, uh, measuring esophageal temperature, um, if it's the one who, that is understood and now, ex and now tested enough to where it is the preferred method to best reflect brain temperature, mm -hmm then I think that's probably the one we should use. Yeah. The well, esophageal think, temperature always seems to be a little more extreme than the yes. bladder, especially if you have somebody who's in renal failure or, you know, has well, Of course. Sure. Renal. But, well, you know, but it's in a, it's in a, it is, I mean, the fact that they're in renal failure, I mean, it still is a, it still is an internal organ. I mean, it's, if it's cold, it's probably because the patient really is in the deep tissue cold. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get the esophageal temperature, it's going to reflect the brain temperature. Mm -hmm. That's true. It isn't necessarily going to reflect the muscle tissue in the leg, yeah, or right. the extremities, or in the bladder, or whatever. So, to the point, I think that to protect the brain, esophageal temperature is the one you need to use. 
I think the other temperatures, you have to recognize their limitation, but I think you have to respect that temperature to avoid rebound cooling. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, if you cool too fast uh -huh. and you get down to 18 degrees and you think everything's great and you did it in 15 minutes and everybody's hooping and hollering and proud, you turn the pump off and 26 or 27 minutes later, if you're not using selective cerebral perfusion, uh, we go to 18 degrees and use selective mm -hmm. cerebral right. perfusion, whether right. I integrate or retrograde, I prefer retrograde, but that's a different topic for a different day. But we still use it, but if, you're, if you aren't, what you think is 18 degrees is now the brain is actually gonna be at 25 degrees. It will be significant. Mm -hmm. And that, if you go back to the chart, cuts into your time of safe, safe hypothermic circulatory rest time significantly. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very sharp, I don't know if you remember looking yeah. at it, but it's very sharp. Um, so to monitor cerebral perfuse temperature <laughs> during warming, it should be assumed that the oxygenator arterial outlet blood temperature underestimates cerebral perfuse temperature. It's a class one, and that's very important. Um, And then here is a class two recommendation, which goes to the case we talked about. To achieve the desired temperature from se for separation from bypass, it is reasonable to maintain a rewarming rate not to exceed a half a degree centigrade per minute. And it's a class 2A mm -hmm. level B. So it's class two recommendation. Now, with that said, these folks, that's, and that's the last of my slides, these folks that did this case were within that parameter. 0.5? They were within that parameter. Oh, really? With that case, they were? They were within, oh. that, they were within mm. that parameter, okay. barely, but within it. But here's my sense. Because remember, they only came from 27. Oh, they didn't come yeah. from 18. So they didn't have a long way to go. Okay. But, but, they rewarmed esophageal, bladder, and rectal all to 37 degrees, which tells me they had to turn that, that because the time that they did it, uh, there's no way that that was set at 37 degrees. Right, because okay. you can't get the bladder the same temperature as esophageal in the same amount of time. It's impossible. Exactly. Yeah. And you go really, really slow, like really slow. Per, well, perhaps, but like if you notice when we, you know, a lot of our hospitals, they will have both temperatures up yeah. and they're rarely the same. Right. Agreed. Totally agree. But here's my point is that they, what they did was took a patient who was at 27 degrees, exceeded the time that is considered safe for circulatory arrest at that temperature. Mm -hmm. And now, instead of just rewarming to maybe 35 and doing therapeutic hypothermia for a while, mm -hmm. or rewarming super slowly, they went to the maximum limit that is recommended by STS and just rewarmed the patient after what was an insult. Well, what's gonna make the insult worse? How, how long was the surgery? Getting rest? warm. 21, 20, 21 minutes. 21 minutes for the big one. Uh, See, I would have calculated in, uh, boy, it's been a long time, but uh, 14 minutes at 27 degrees. Mm hmm. To re yeah. Well, they. No, they, 14 minutes for circuit rest. Yeah. Circuit rest. Yes. 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 And that's probably close to what it had right. yes. said on there. Yes. Right. Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 Well, they Agreed. Okay. They definitely went yeah. over the time. And it was 21 minutes. And they didn't have enough. They weren't cold enough. No, clearly not. And I mean, it's obvious that, it, that, you know, it's obvious what happened, I think, to, mm -hmm. you know, everyone. Um, but what did we learn from it? Um, cool enough for all occasions. Yes. For mm -hmm. all possibilities. I've, I have done a case before where I've been told it's just going to be real quick. And we don't have to, you know, do cerebral perfusion. We're just going to clamp and go. Clamp and it, go. Clamp and go. Um, we did cool. And... Um, but we also got to that because they were always 20 minutes or less and we'll be fine clamp and mm -hmm. go and not something terrible happened but a minor setback happened 
and we got real close to not being done. And then you're already in it. And, yeah, you know, no like you're not anything. getting the cerebral perfusion hooked up quickly. And, right. You know. Yeah. Right. So you never know. And yeah. this was a person who's experienced doing it, doesn't usually have disastrous cases. Yeah. Um, and you just never know. No, you don't. You can always just, I've never done this, but I, I suppose if the surgeon is in a hurry, you just tell him, you know, you can go do another case while we're rewarming. You know? Yeah, actually, uh, I don't know about another case. That's but a I, really good idea. But I did have. I like that idea. Uh, I know surgeons that would love to do that. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> In my experience, when I got to do these great, you know, complicated uh, cases when I was a student, a surgeon did break scrub, and I don't yeah. know what he did. Maybe he did another case. Maybe he ate lunch or whatever. But while we warmed, and then that way he's That's not way better, standing right? there staring right. at you. Yeah. Right. You got to safely rewarm. But they right. did this all the time, so right. you know it wasn't a surprise to him. Right. That it, it's going to take us, you know, right. an hour or right. whatever. It's an gonna... extra two or three hours seems like an eternity for you know for making sure that you have great cooling mm -hmm. and that you have adequate warming. I realize that, but to what end? Well, this patient's dead, so that's well, the end. Yeah, and I think that, you know, and you don't warm enough, and then you have coagulopathies later that are cold coagulopathies, mm -hmm. you know, and you're, because the patient is cold, mm -hmm. too cold, and then they have arrhythmias and they have issues. John, what's your thoughts, man? Let me pull you into this mess. Yeah, I, I didn't see the, the case. I just caught in here the last, uh, uh, 10, 15 minutes, but um, um, the the thing that I always thought to myself is when a surgeon said cool to a certain temperature, if I could, I tried to cheat down another couple degrees if I could, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, just as insurance. Um, and um, if, if they say it's gonna be quick, um, you know, what if it isn't? That's the problem. What if it, it probably is nine times out of 10, and that one time it goes, you know, 10, 15 minutes longer than yeah. the mm -hmm. real quick we thought it was only going to be 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's when you get into a quandary when it just doesn't go well and mm -hmm. you're cutting it with no margin of error mm -hmm. for it to be worse than mm -hmm. what we thought it was going to be, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, back in the days we did use bladder and, and rectal because it was believed that the head is very insulated, it's an internal organ, and the similar things that we can put a probe into were bladder and rectal, and those are also, <clears throat> excuse me, very insulated organs. So we just sort of thought that those would correlate, but that goes back quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And then as you said, with nasal pharyngeal and maybe esophageal, with the ice going on the chest, the cardioplegia and different things, those seem to be way colder than what we were getting with our bladder and rectal mm -hmm. temperature. Mm -hmm. So those seem to be, you know, influenced by the ice, like you said. And so we didn't truly really trust those. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting what, what you're saying here now is, you know, that uh, an esophageal, but maybe even deeper, which again, you're getting close to the stomach, right? Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah, I, 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 I ask him to do that. I mean, I've done that a lot. I've done, you know, I've done a lot of work, uh, temperature related type stuff on a lot of pigs. And uh, I've, uh, I have actually put the uh, probe, you know, down into right in, like right at the, the, the entrance of the stomach. And then, you know, I have taken a, a uh, temperature probe and put it through the eye into the brain and, uh, and measured those temperatures really? and looked, wow. at those, looked at those differences. Huh. And uh, it's very interesting at how the brain will, depending on where you're at on your temperature going down or going up, your brain will be higher than your bladder. And I'm like, how can that possibly be? I mean, how is this possible? I think and it's because uh, it gets more flow. Yeah. It's very, yes. Yeah. It gets I think more that flow. may be part of it. But of course, I have this whole animal at a temperature. Sure. Yeah. And yet, and I'm like, is, are these calibrated? What's wrong with these probes? At first, I thought there was something wrong with the probes. Right. Hmm. But there's not anything wrong with the probe. Yeah. The brain just, for some reason, is hotter. This is really enlightening. As and far it might as be what, from know. activity, you know, because it's just hmm. a computer, right? Hmm. You know? Yeah. I really don't know the reason, but that would be, that's my, that's at least my hypothesis. Um, untested, unproven, but that's what I think. It's just, it's, it's creating, it's creating heat because it's an energy source. It's a, it's a computer, it's a processor. 
And mm -hmm. so if you have electrical activity, if you have a lot of activity going on, it's going to generate heat, kind of like that computer over there does. Mm. That's what I think. Too bad we don't have the lights, green, yellow, and red, I yellow. know. We need that. We need that. Yes. Yeah. The eyes, through the eyes. Anyway, John, so I need to ask you a question. Um, I'll ask you the same question I had asked Tammy and, 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 uh, and, and Patrick. So you come in to do a case. It's going to be a revision of a type 1 dissection because they have now have a pseudoaneurysm. Your uh, uh, predicted uh, uh, circulatory arrest time is going to be less than 15 minutes. And uh, you're told, cool to 27, we're not using any cerebral perfusion, and we're, gonna we're just going to clamp and go. So, um, uh, and we're going to cool to only to 27, only cool to 27. Um, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? I'm probably going to say, okay, and cool, like I said, a little more aggressively down to 25, <laughs> uh -huh. if I can. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and try to see if we can get some insurance against something going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to work closely with the surgeon. If they're very rigid, they're going to get on you really bad if they look up and see that you went to 25 and 27 instead of 27 like they asked. You know, you're going to have to uh, navigate that and uh, and see what you're going to say about that. Mm -hmm. um, so you wouldn't say, I would, you, would, you time where would you challenge we, uh, them? Um, no, I'm sorry. Turning, Go ahead, I'm sorry. We, we, in a, not a circuitry rest case, but we kept turning the flow down because the flooding was so bad, you know? Mm -hmm. The flooding was so bad, the flooding was so bad, and we had to keep turning the flow down. He finally just told me to turn the flow off. You know, just, just turn the flow off. We were doing a regular, you know, valve case or something. We were at like 30 degrees. Turn the flow off for a couple minutes, it'll be fine. Well, this went on like off and on throughout the case, and you know he's trying to get the heart right and trying to get everything so sewn together perfectly on the heart. And finally, I said, you know, the brain has to be alive at the end of the day too, doctor. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and if that doesn't happen, all the sewing on the heart in the world isn't going to make any difference. Yeah. So um, I, I think you just have to work real close with the surgeon and see if you can uh, buy yourself some insurance against something going wrong. Or maybe you have the, uh, the the retrograde cerebral cannulas at the ready. You're ready to do it. You're not going to be fumbling uh, with it if you have to get it in quick. Uh, I'd like to have some type of safety net or insurance uh, plan going. Uh, is basically what I would what I would try to think of to myself. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't say no. You wouldn't say uh, that is not going to. Um that is not going to work out too terribly well. Like if you said, just go to 27, would you would you challenge them and say, you really think that's a good idea? Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, what's the safe circulatory rest time at 27 degrees? It is in 15 minutes. It's less, yeah. it's less yeah. than 15 well, minutes. Well, I think, too, this goes back to... And this to was 21 minutes, by the way. It ended up 21 minutes at yeah. 27 Which degrees. Is, yeah, so that's... And you, have a, you had a patient who was brain dead. Yeah. Because that right. was uh, so you cut, you eight cut minutes longer than it should have been, that's how long it takes. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and don't you think this is another uh, example of having um, established, printed protocols and policies? Because yes. then you can just fall back on that. This is the policy for how we do this. I'm yes. sorry, we have to go to this. That is incredibly powerful, very good point. And uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And we should have that because, you know, right now the surgeons we work with are all great. Yeah. And the only one that ever would have tried something like that is no longer here, thankfully. Um, but uh, but I, we can always get somebody else that will. You right. Know. right. I think that's a real uh, that's a real protection for us, especially, you know, because we work under the direction of doctors, is we have these established, known Recommendations at the and hospitals. At, at the hospitals. Not our internal. Because we right. can have an internal protocol, well, we can, but we have to have something that is agreed upon at the hospital. Well, it's a, the way we did it when I worked for a hospital institution was we had all of our protocols <clears throat> and procedures, and whoever those affected, uh, like I think Cell Saver fell under pathology. And so the head pathologist every year had to sign and date that he has approved this protocol. Good point. And you know, they review it heavily the first year, but if you got the same guy, then he just has a signature, and then the next year he signs that it is still the policy of uh, how we're going to do cell savers. And we did the same thing right. for every single surgeon's even basic pr 
procedures that they were going to do and they signed off on it every year and then if there's ever a question you just nope this is this is what's approved this is what we've decided you know this is how we're going to do it and then when there's revisions you note the revision and then it's you know it's handwritten for that year or whatever you don't have to type up a new one if mm -hmm. one little thing changed and then at the beginning of the next year you have a correct one and you keep all of the old ones and you can see the revisions as you go through i like it yeah i like that a lot john have that you have you seen sense. that at some of the places that um you've been i know you do a lot of traveling about having these uh procedures and protocols available and approved by the doctors that we're working under yes i have and i tell you that the, the the big the big perfusion groups the big perfusion groups that you you could think of the names off the top of your head are really good about having these very elaborate protocols and they try to disseminate them to all their perfusionists and they try to incorporate them at all their hospitals and if they have a compliance officer they come by once or twice a year and update and say hey do you have your protocols and there's no signature at the bottom of that whole protocol mm -hmm. that any doctor has said oh yeah this is what i agree with you need to take it up to their office and 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 uh coerce them to, to take a look at it over the weekend and see if they can sign off on it and get it back to you now some of your smaller accounts here and there i go places i don't see any protocols on much much things at all sometimes you just mm -hmm. you just go in you well, know and uh it, and wing it it's called winging it <laughs> well it's almost more important at these uh, not necessarily small but non-large uh, groups to have these kinds of protocols because you may not do circulatory arrest for example more than once a year and you got your perfusionist in there and if they're preparing for this case you can thumb through we even had you know diagrams of this is how you do integrate this is how you do retrograde this is how you could alter your circuit because we didn't have you know specialized things were just snapping in we had to build them each time this is what you show your scrub tech etc because we didn't do those very often and that's another protection that you're going to be able to do the job you need to do well mm -hmm. I agree with you 100 percent and I think I think we uh, we outside of our education portion we as a company need to do better at that yeah. we yeah. have it but yeah. we're not we're not where we need to be and I'm seeing that I'm th I love these kinds of programs because it teaches me so much I learned so much from these things I think we need to get better at that yeah I think it mm -hmm. I think it helps improve your practice no matter if you're a one man or you're like you said the really large groups they are you know they have people who that's their job yes. and that's what they do yes and I worked for one of those large groups at one time and mm -hmm. you should have seen the training just on the cell mm -hmm. saver you know it was like a spiral notebook and you would think oh I don't need all that kind of training but often they had people who didn't have any formal training so they made a cell saver you know training uh, manual training manual which we actually have that yeah, too yeah but um, I, I think that's a good thing, you know. Uh, maybe it's not something that we need to look at, but occasionally you might reference it. Oh, what are some of the things that are contraindicated, uh, you know, to suck up into the cell saver? Oh, I've never heard of that. Oh, it's not on the list or this, that, the other. I think mm, they're good to have. That's a very good point. And while we're on the air, thanks for volunteering. Oh. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> so mean. I was almost going to warn you. Okay. Like, don't so go too mean. deep there. Thank you, you for volunteering. That is great. Man, I'll tell you what. We'll talk about this. So uh, I'm always so proud of you. I always, you have such great ideas. Um, always so willing to contribute. So, so with that Stop said, so with that quiet. said, can we please, and John, do you need to leave? I need to take about a, a 20 minute break. I should be back. Okay, okay, so I know you need to go for 20 minutes. We're going to also take a five-minute break, okay. and then maybe six minutes. And is that good for you? No, I think it's 12. You need 10? Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, we're going to take five for me and five for David. And then we're going to be back, and we're going to do uh, Patrick's uh, presentation, an update on scavenging the uh, anesthesia gas from our oxygenator gas outlet port. So sounds good. And we're going to hear more about WAG. That's right? right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. WAGged. 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 You're going to be WAGged. OK, good. So 10 <laughs> minutes. Wow. Give us 10 minutes. We'll be right back. Hey, Joe. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. 
Leva Nova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. 
Without the Epoch device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by perfusionists and for perfusionists. Create a free account and check us out today.
and welcome back to the show, everyone. Thank you very much for letting us take that break. We had a little something to eat, a little go to the bathroom. Hopefully you did too. Um, with that said, I wanna, before we uh, uh, introduce again Patrick and his presentation, I wanna remind you that we're doing basically Mondays and Thursdays on the Journal Club and on the M&M, mm -hmm. and we're alternating the times. So the Mondays are in the morning for our European colleagues and friends, and then, and probably also Asiatic. And um, we're usually Australian. the first or second Monday, just kind of depending on yes. yeah, the date. Yes, correct. The date can be, you're right. It's all on perfweb.us. Mm -hmm. And then the Thursday program is in the afternoon, uh, 5 o'clock to 7.20, mm -hmm. for more of our American colleagues, Canadian colleagues, and also Hawaii and places like that. Probably could still catch it, I think, at that time. It's still during the day for them, but... You know, we're doing the best we can to try to find the optimal times. But I did want to plug it because it's going to be higher and something that John Ingram is going to be very interested in. He's not on with this now. <coughs> he's going to go do something. But higher arterial pressure during CPB may not reduce the risk of acute kidney injury. And I mm -hmm. think that's going to be a very provocative, very good topic. So, And that's uh, mm -hmm. what date? That is going to be Thursday, August 20th. At 5 p.m. to 7:20. So we can have from now. Roughly. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do an M and M on another case that I find in the legal yeah. place that, that I good. look. That was yeah. good. Mm -hmm. It was a good case. I thought it was yeah. an interesting yeah. case. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and we try to be respectful. I mean, you know, things happen. You know, I mean, it just does. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. You know, you redact everything so no one can identify where it was mm -hmm. or whatever, and not be too specific about some things, uh, which I think is, you know, but we learn from each other's experiences. And well, don't I think, you think some I of the learn a lot from, from reviewing that, that, that legal literature that mm -hmm. exists. And even as a, just a, as a team or as an individual, when you make a mistake or you see something you could have done differently, and hopefully it's not as serious mm -hmm. as, you know, causing mm -hmm. patient harm, but even just the smallest things, if it's a mistake that uh, you discuss, then everyone can learn from it. And often you yourself are not going to make that mistake again. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, I've given that presentation. I know you've, you've, uh, you've seen it. I think you were here. You, I think you may have been here too. But I mean, I have four, and I really, I think it's five if I really, you know, if I thought about it, but four times for ap with absolute certainty that I don't know how the patient survived and did fine because I really <laughs> did everything I could to kill him. I did. I, 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 unknowingly. I just had a, well, yes, it was unknowingly. I mean, it was a, an error. I mean, I, I, there's four cases that I have nightmares about where I screwed up. And you did you know? a presentation on that? Uh -huh. All four wow. of them. Good for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. All of the patients survived. All yeah. of the patients did fine. None of them had any, any morbidity mm -hmm. associated with the event. They survived despite my best efforts. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Which, uh, and you know, all of those, those four, of course, that's one every 10 years, you know, 40, this is my 43rd year, right, as a perfusionist. So it's one every, you know, one every decade. So I just need to make it, through. I just need to retire before this decade's out. <laughs> Hopefully I won't have yet another incident. But I do cases now under supervision, so just so you that's know. That's not true. You, know, so, you, and do, that's, your that's you very do your important. own cases. Uh, under supervision, yeah. I have somebody else there. You always Can you set it up for me? Yeah. I'll oh be there. Gosh. Just let me you know, go on and come off. And, you know, I have to do what I have to do, right, to get my to keep my certification. So, you know, I do what I need to do. But I'm good at ECMO watching. I do a lot of that. That's a case. Yeah, it's a it's a case. It is. It counts. Is that Thank a whole God. case or a half case? No, it's a whole case. It's it a, is, really. six well, hours. an initiation okay. or oh, I thought it was eight, but it's six. They changed it a couple oh, okay. years ago. So okay. initiation uh, is it's, a full case. Oh, really? Wow. Um, yeah. Up to two hours uh, before you can start. Uh, you know switch over to like another person you can't initiate and immediately go uh, to another right. person um, and then it used to be eight hours of ECMO monitoring yeah. would count as a full pump case but now it's six mm -hmm. so when we monitor five ECMOs yeah, no, no. could we get five no. cases it, you no. know and you can't oh, also do uh, a 12-hour no. shift and get two cases it's per shift oh, right. a minimum right. of six hours right Right. Yeah. So, no, 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 no. But that's how I keep that's how I keep my certification. 
I mean, yeah. thank God for that. Well, have you and noticed? And interestingly enough, Angiovac is considered a case as well. Did thank you, goodness. Did you note? Oh, yeah. Uh, did mm -hmm. you notice uh, on renewal this year the the survey? Did anyone take it? I didn't. Okay, that one of the a couple of the questions it. were. I don't know. I saw it somewhere. I did I mine. I know I did my certification. Yeah. I did. Uh, was uh, about whether or not um, you think an ECMO person needs separate certification for ECMO, cell saver, pediatric. Oh, I remember that question. Yeah. I and it no. was just it was just a, a you know poll. I think that's stupid. <laughs> that's just stupid. I don't. I actually thought it was really um, interesting. I'm interested to see what people think. Well, I may be interested to see what people think, but the idea of it is stupid. That's like telling a heart surgeon that he he's certified for coronaries, but not an aortic valve. He yeah. would have to have a certification to do coronaries, aortic valve, mitral yeah. valve. No. Okay. I'm with I you. Mean, like we learned, ridiculous. we basically we learned as a group. Yeah. Our uh, and thank goodness we did our ECMO program. I mean, we we weren't really doing ECMO. Uh, well, very well, much. What do, you, what do you do? You're in an account. I don't mean to interrupt you. I know you want to say it, but you're <laughs> sitting there in an account. This is a good conversation. This is probably better than your talk. So, um, <laughs> probably maybe. So it certainly was better than mine. But um, you're in an account that um, doesn't normally do ECMO, and you're not ECMO certified, and huh? then you have a patient who can't get off pump, and you need to put them on ECMO until so the cavalry comes to rescue you. You take the patient to. To another facility. What I have the an hell answer do you for that. Do? Well, I have an answer for All that. Right, well, go ahead. Obviously, you're going to be able to tell how I voted on this particular question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think that you have, you should. I mean, I don't know that you. I think it could be an. I don't think it should necessarily uh, exclude you from this care, but I think it could be, you know, just like the certified uh, nurse OR that certification that they can get. Mm -hmm. CNOR. It, yeah, or, that, that, yeah, that one. Um, could be something additional uh, for perfusionists to get. And here's how you do it if you have a small program. It's how I did it at my previous program. We didn't get a lot of ECMOs. You get ECMO educated, however that may be. It may be going mm -hmm. to an ECMO course, or maybe it's just a program you develop within your own team mm -hmm. where you, know, you educate yourself. And then if mm -hmm. you, uh, at whatever intervals you find necessary, you do wet labs. Did them all the time. Okay. Did. I, 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 okay, I respect your opinion. I 100% disagree with it. The only one that I would say out of what you had mentioned that makes sense to me, well, two things, um, is the pediatric. Ooh. I think that, I think that pediatric perfusion and pediatric perfusionists are very different creatures yes. from those of us that, that live and operate in the adult world. But should it, in that same scenario, let's say, you're not a pediatric hospital, but you get a pediatric case, it's emergent, you mm -hmm. gotta do the case, should it exclude you from being able to do that case if you don't no. have the certification? Of course not. Okay. No, no, but I think that the because I think, in that situation, it's going to be do the case or there's no patient, and the patient's going to pass away. Right, 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 right. Yeah, right. I mean, that just makes sense. It's kind of like the ECMO, the same mm -hmm. thing. But I think that perfusion <clears throat> is, you know, an all-encompassing thing. You know, I just think ECMO, angiovac, autotransfusion. The only thing I would say is I think there needs to be a society of... Um, transfusion management specialists, mm -hmm. auto transfusionists, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. Because right now it's the Wild West. It is. You can take a person who was working at the car wash and get them credentialed, sit them in front of a machine, and just basically teach them how to push the buttons and not do anything else and not really understand what they're doing in any way, shape, or form. And it is allowable, it's acceptable, and it occurs. It doesn't occur with us, but it does occur. Yeah. Well. This wasn't a question, but what do you think about people who only maintain their certification um, doing ECMO monitoring? Like me? I'm just asking. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, <laughs> it's great. Do you think, but 
you you can do other cases. You come in for other with cases with supervision. Okay. Do you think yeah. a person should be able to? Oh, John's back. Hey, John. Hey, John. Yeah. We that were just a great discussing noise. that. John, John made himself. John, we uh, we know you're here now. <laughs> hey, John. We were uh. just discussing the um, survey uh, when we did our uh, renewal this year. Some of the questions about the additional certifications and what you know if you thought that was necessary for pediatric ECMO and uh, cell saver. Mm -hmm. I think it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, my question was, we had a little bit of a debate going on there, but people who, uh, perfusionists, who just maintain their certification with strictly ECMO monitoring, not initiation, just monitoring, and no bypass cases, do you think that that certification, it, that, that's enough to maintain a full certification? Um, I think they're two separate questions, so I'm going to answer you, I'm gonna answer you uh, in two different ways. Yes, it is enough to maintain your certification because those are the rules mm -hmm. and you're following the rules. Right. B, the second answer is no. I think that that is why um, I would not d you know, dare to go crashing into some hospital to throw some pump together and go on, and go on pump with the patient for a routine elective unless it was a an unless it was truly a life or death like this is this is your only option mm -hmm. i think we all have a personal professional screw the personal professional ethical, responsibility sure. ethical and professional responsibility so you know do i do cases yes do i do enough cases to be competent hell no Mm -hmm. You know, I used to be, but, but see, I don't. Thank you for answering that, because that goes right back to what I was trying to say about the ECMO. Exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. If you don't do a lot of ECMO, the way you maintain your skills is through a wet lab, through continual mm -hmm. education. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying people who don't do ECMO ever can't do ECMO, but I mm -hmm. think if you're going to have ECMO offered as a service at your mm -hmm. hospital and you don't get a lot, I do think that um, some kind of education periodically, you know, with hands-on kind of stuff and even, you know, how to manage them, uh, just reviewing mm -hmm. that kind of education is warranted. But I think that's valuable. I'm not, I'm not disputing that I think doing wet labs, I think educating, you know, getting skills training, thinking things through, reading things, being part of program like this. I think all of those are, again, our professional responsibility. So I agree with everything up to, however, and excluding having a board certification mm -hmm. for doing ECMO when you're a perfusionist. That mm -hmm. doesn't make really does for me doesn't make sense not even as an extra qualification well, again I mean, not I don't know. necessarily believe it in an exclusionatory manner mm -hmm. I guess that's mm -hmm. how you'd say that mm -hmm. yeah not not even for that because I think yeah of course you could use it as a as a as a marketing tool for yourself I am ECMO certified or mm -hmm. I'm ECMO credential or I'm ECMO skill whatever the term you want to mm -hmm. use I mean certainly that would be good for you know for I get On marketing, paper. you know, <clears throat> right, marketing, but I mean, I know a lot of people that do a lot of ECMO that don't do it well, um, you know, yeah. so that doesn't even mean anything. To well, them. It, and, but if know, they were certified, they would have to have passed some level of s some standard, right? I passed it. I passed the test. You know, you want me to do it your case? Probably not. So, but in all seriousness, getting back to the issue of the cases, where my certification, continued certification really does help is... You know, I'm, I'm not as skilled and as sharp anymore, and in particular, doing all of the QCs on all the stuff, the laboratory stuff, I'm gonna fall out of compliance very quickly. And I can't move at the pace that you all move at now because I'm unfamiliar. I don't have that everyday familiarity. Yeah. But if you're doing a case and I'm around, or you're doing a case, and I'm around, and you need a break to use the restroom, mm -hmm. or you need an extra set of hands, mm -hmm. or whatever, I have enough 
exposure and experience to feel like I can be a great assistant. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have that certification, then I lose that ability. ability yeah. Absolutely. And so I think that's why I'm comfortable with what the rules are for maintaining my certification as a perfusionist. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's the board's responsibility. I think it ultimately is my responsibility and my colleagues that I work with's responsibility to say, you know, I should not do that whole case. I can do this, but I, 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 I really shouldn't be doing this. Um, and doing what is the right thing to do for patient safety. That's what I think. John, but if do it's you have ECMO, any comments on that since you're the ECMO guy? You know, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but it does work both ways. I'm not trying to argue the point, but I go on travels and I see this all the time where people are on their regular job, they don't really do any ECMO, and they're on a three-week vacation, and nowadays the demand is so high for ECMO coverage that they can go out, work on the side, do three weeks worth of ECMO shifts, and get double paid at their job for their vacation pay, and you know the money's rolling in, and that's the only ECMO they're gonna see, and maybe that's the only ECMO they've seen in a long time, and I see this a lot lately where people that don't see much ECMO are, like Joe's saying, you're rusty on pumping cases. There's an awful lot of people that are pretty rusty at, at doing the ECMO, and I, and I see circuits set up wrong and things left off, and yeah. then problem solving is, uh, is lacking, just like um, somebody who didn't do it very often would be. Yeah, that, uh, was, that was my point with the, I don't think a certification would be necessarily a bad thing, is mm -hmm. it just, might force people to adhere to certain, I don't know what they would be, certain things that you have to do that if you're going to do ECMO, which is very similar to bypass, but also very different uh, right. to maintain your competency. I don't Well, um, yeah. The, the thing is, it's like the person uh, needs to represent themselves on their resume in an interview properly. If you are Great. doing ECMO only for two or three years and you decide you want to go and get another job, well, you're going to go back to pumping cases. Um, I mean, I had this in reverse. I hadn't done ECMO for a very long period of time. And when I first started, I told people, look, you know, I haven't done it in a very long time. I'm easily trainable. I'm all ears. I'm all eyes. And I'm reading everything I can put my hands on and watching educational videos, but I haven't done it. Even to this day, if somebody calls me about a pediatric or, a, mm. or neonatal uh, ECMO, I'm going to tell them it's been a very long time since I've done one. More than happy to come and help you, but I want you to know that you need to be very close to the phone, you know, because I'll give somebody a call right away if there's something I don't, I don't feel secure about. Well, so if you take that same person who wants to suddenly go pump cases, mm -hmm. I hope they would represent themselves as saying, I've been actively in perfusion for X number of years. But it's been a while since I've actually pumped a case. I think I could get back into it. Like Joe, you know, you're you're probably highly trainable, but you're going to have to get back in and pump, you know, a dozen cases or so before you get, you know, your feet securely under you and get quicker, like you said. Well, I think yeah. that, that that's mm -hmm. a perfect point uh, as to what Joe was saying. It's our ethical and professional responsibility, and you would hope that that's what people would do. Well, know. I do think, and I think I agree with uh, I agree with everything that both of you have said. Um, all three of you included you, Patrick, um, and I think that uh, you know there's there's I think people who are younger, like let's say Patrick. I mean, can I use you as an example? Especially if you say younger, you know. Thanks. Well, you are much younger than I am, um, but you were out of perfusion for a period of time. Yeah. And then, you know, you came back and it was a very, it was a process. Yeah. Right? It took, and I was honest it, up front. I told you I haven't well, I knew that. done yeah. a case, you know, just yeah, like you was, said, John. I mean, that, that yeah. was my interview as I said, this is my situation. Right. You yeah. want to come yeah, back and you want to come yeah. back into perfusion and this is what I've been doing and so forth. But, but that was a whole process. You were proctored. You went through. I think that, that, that it's like riding a bike to a point, mm -hmm. but you have to get that flow of what's going on and stuff so yeah. i think that that's really the issue i at my at for somebody like you it's gonna matter for somebody like me john i'm not going anywhere i'm not going i'm not i'm not you know 
I mean, I'm done, basically. I don't think I'm, I'm yeah. really ever going to. I mean, I'll be a good. I'm going to be somebody's good first assistant. That's what I'm going to be good at, I think, at this point. I used to feel like that was my identity. I used to feel like doing cases was my identity mm -hmm. for years and years and years and years and years. And I guess if something were to happen where, you know, I had to go back to work, you know, I would go f just, you know, find somebody that would let me work so that I could do some cases, do enough cases to become competent again. Um, and I probably could. It would take me a little bit of a little bit of time, but I don't think it would take me that long. I mean, maybe three months or something like that of doing cases every day. I'd probably feel pretty comfortable. Well, even mm -hmm. uh, I would hope that when I know we do this and previous employment did this, when you bring someone onto the team, they could be very experienced, but you don't just throw them into the room and go, that's a pump. I know you know how to use right. it. You know, right. You give them some time to grow a little bit right. in their competency. And know your routine yeah, right, absolutely. and your vernacular and mm -hmm. all of the things that make a cardiac, a heart care team surgery part of it what makes them function, you know, mm -hmm. knowing who the people are, how they communicate, what they expect, when to talk, what to say, how they say what they say, because, I mean, surgeons say all kinds of things to yes. indicate or a whole variety of Or don't say anything things. at all and have hand signals. Right, right. <laughs> and have hand signals, which is the worst thing in the world. I'm not, you, yeah, you're not always worst thing just in the world. looking at the hands. No, you should always... You, they should always communicate what they want and you should always repeat it back to them and have a, an acknowledgement that, you know, that was what I said. Yeah. Um, because I just think that's a safety issue. That oh, yeah. just makes I've been sense. A parent, I've been called that actually, because mm -hmm. I repeat everything back. Yes. Always. It's very easy on, off, too. on, off. Yeah. They can sound very similar. Okay. Uh, it, yes. Or <laughs> down, up. You know, and or whatever it may be. You know, I mean, I've vent I've, on, vent off. It sounds very similar. If does. they're not facing so, uh, you, you're behind them. <laughs> we had somebody who used to. That's funny. I worked at a place where, for whatever reason, the surgeons on and off sounded so similar that every time he said it, he would spell it out, and the sur and the perfusionist would spell it back to him. So he'd go some O N, and the, <laughs> and, the and the perfusionist would say some O N or O F F. They would. They stop saying on and off altogether. Well, I that is so funny because I used to do that. Yeah, I had a surgeon right? that did say, that too. They would say, you know, turn the sump off. And I would say, okay, OFF. O -F -F. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. And then I just started saying OF. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I got someone too who was a mumbler and it, it, difficult to understand to start saying up and down because on and off because yes. that's a lot easier to understand yes. and it would be down to off no just down yeah. low whatever you know but those right. are a lot easier to understand for that exact reason but that's funny i did spell it one time off -F? yeah yeah i've done i used to do that all the time okay so um Patrick's, you ready to go on yeah. to your presentation sure. yeah good yeah, kinda, okay, nice conversation yeah. thank you john okay so you're gonna stay with us for a minute gonna, john you going to be able to stay for a while, John? A little bit longer, yeah, sure. Good, okay, okay. Right. so let's talk about scavenging. All right, so... Um, I think you should just take the hose and put it into one of those, like, like Benny masks and just put it right from the exhaust port right to you. So you can pass right out? Yeah, so yeah. you can be happy during the procedure. That way you don't have to worry about the procedure. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Low stress. <laughs> hey, that's you. I recognize your ear. No, that's not me. Oh, darn. That would have been fun. If it no, was. that's Rod that's like. Yeah. No, I was just making a joke. <laughs> that's Rodell. <laughs> I don't know who that is. It looks like a Filipino ear to me. No. <laughs> Can you edit that? Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, so uh, racist. Let's just talk real briefly about the. I mean, and I mean really briefly about the history of uh, anesthesia gas and uh, you know how these chemicals are made and what they're used for because they're not only used for um, for anesthesia; they're used for industrial reasons as well. They use them for pumps and air conditioning and all kinds of stuff. But, um, you know, many, many years ago, they used to just give you some whiskey before they pulled out your tooth or whatever. But um, this guy right here, uh, Dr. John Collins Warren, was the first person to administer and also document the use of ether. And he's the guy here with this Dude. skull. Dude. So that's his LinkedIn Dude. picture. <laughs> Dude. 
<laughs> dude, that dude looks scary. Yeah. He looks very dramatic. So, but they did yes. uh, <clears throat> in the picture. Is there a way to do a pointer on this? Uh, a pointer? Well, oh, no, no one can see your pointer. Yeah, the pointer. You can have work. the mouse. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. And here, give him the mouse pad. Right. That'll help. Yeah. You just have to move it quickly to make it pop uh -oh, up. I accidentally okay. clicked something. Yeah, you'll so see. Careful. It. Oops. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, there you there go. There we are. Wow. Okay. Oh, can um, you hit the escape button yeah. or something on the slides? I think we hit. Oh, click the button. Click the left. Click the left. No. No, this one. The mouse. There we go. Oh. Okay. Oh. There we go. All right. Okay. So um, anyway, this this guy just had a simple uh, tooth extraction, but they did use ether, and I more than likely that looks like the original ether bottle. It's from a from a uh, a museum of uh, anesthesia. So yeah. uh, they and they did. He did, he was rendered unconscious and then woke up, and uh, looks like they're still kind of holding him down there. Mm -hmm. One of the big issues with ether, though, is that, I mean, it, it's a natural, naturally occurring product, but it's very, very flammable. So there were operating room fires. There were all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these guys, they look like they were smoking pipes and things during the surgery. No anyway. doubt. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so moving forward, um, we've gone through several, uh, but very, very similar halogenated anesthetics. And the process of, of converting ether into a halogenated product is that you take the hydrogen atom and you remove it and replace it with a fluorine album, atom. And this is why these are all ending in, in fluorine. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, uh, I know you said you've been around long enough that you had used... Uh, halothane. Halothane. Hal mm -hmm. Halothane oh, wow. at one point. And I think I might have seen that at some point somewhere. I don't know if I ever used it, but I think I've seen it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, probably in a museum. Yeah. <laughs> well, so um, a museum. I will tell you this before you go on. Do you yeah. know what happens if you take sevoflurane and uh, it's certainly halothane? And I think, uh, what was the other one that was real? There was halothane and then there was des. That was it desflurane? No, it wasn't desflurane. It was something else. I can't remember anymore. Mm -hmm. Forane. 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 No, forane is isoforane. Fluorine. Isofluorine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you take that isofluorine and you pour it on your oxygenator, just <laughs> spill some on it. Yeah. Or a connector. I know what happens. You know what happens? Mm -hmm. It melts. It melts. Yeah. yeah. It's a solvent. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. That's, that's why I have you noticed that most pumps have it. It's all the way the over there. Furthest the away. The opposite side of the from the yes. Yeah. Yes. Dangerous, dangerous stuff around polycarbonate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why they normally mount stuff. that, you know, yeah. <coughs> off to the side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully. You, know, yeah. you yeah. never see it like right over the arterial pump. I right? have. Yeah. You have, really. Oh, I most certainly have. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen all kinds of things. John probably has too. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, go on. Yeah. Okay. So um, these three that I'm kind of highlighting here have very similar actions. No one actually knows the, the real action. This is kind of like propofol. I mean, there's, there's no real science as to why it actually works, but, um, but they do work. And um, they all have their own little advantages, and they've changed over the time, over time. But um, the sevoflurane is the newest that most people are using right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it does cause depression of the ce cerebral metallic, I'm sorry, metabolic. Act, uh, requirements. So that's one of the benefits to sevoflurane and why people use it now. Desflurane uh, was popular more a little bit earlier, and that's because it's very, very, very short acting. So uh -huh. give it, it's gone. Right? It, it, and, and I actually have used desflurane, and that is true. I mean, you, if you're having a, a, a pressure issue and you're at 3% and you come down to 1% or something, Immediate. it's gone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty nice. I've in never that seen way. that one. I've never gotten it. It's to use old, and not a lot of people use it anymore, mm -hmm. but it is around. <coughs> and then isoflurane, we're still using that at some of our hospitals. Um, it's the most commonly used, and uh, one of the reasons people like this one is it does not have any or uh, very little cardiac depressive effects. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be able to, you know, come off pump and not have any any issues related to this. Although it all pretty much dissipates pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we talk about you know, these gases, first off, I believe it's in one of the slides or it isn't, but I did find out that, um, you know, we put these gases into the oxygenator and they're on, the only, uh, what is it, 5 to 
are actually used. So 90% is coming out the other side. Mm. So it's not really wow. metabolized that well in the oxygenator. And so a lot of it does escape into the room. Well, so it's not absorbed. Exactly. Not absorbed by the oxygenator. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, uh, anesthesiologists and the anesthesia machines, it's entirely common. No one would even consider running one of those machines without scavenging the, the, uh, the gas on yeah. the outlet. Whereas we as perfusionists, and, and we've done a, uh, we, we did a survey on this, I believe one of those guys will remember, but, or you might remember, I think 30% of the people that we surveyed were not scavenging gas, which may not sound that outrageous until I show you what I'm about to show you, because this is the big, this is the big bomb slide, so. Um, hey, hey, Patrick, can it, I ask you a question real quick? Sure. How much percentage when an anesthesiologist gives it, you know, through the native lung, how much percentage of this is absorbed through the native lung? Yeah, Here, through the native idea. lung? Mm. I don't know. Well, you That's get a really good MAC, question. Right, you have yep. a MAC, mm -hmm. a minimal minimal alveolar concentration mm -hmm. for right. effect. But how he's, you're asking how much comes out when they exhale. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. you know, your first presentation on this was absolutely fascinating because if I had a bet I would have thought about 95% of this anesthesia gas does get absorbed through our oxygenator and 5% was being discharged. It's actually the other way around. About 5% of what we're sending to the oxygenator makes its, makes its way to the blood and 90 or 95% makes its way out of the exhaust. And I'm just wondering how our artificial lung uh, must be a huge factor there uh, compared to the native lung. I, I would think that a huge amount of it is absorbed in the native lung, but I don't, I don't know that at all. And I, didn't I don't know. know. There's somebody knows. I mean, there's, there's a way to find that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the your fact third, that they, your next update. Yeah. My next update. They, the fact that they are scavenging means, I mean, a lot of it is, is getting out. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, um, in looking at what happens with, with these gases when you are exposed to them uh, chronically, is you can get nausea, which I have not really experienced during a pump case, mm -hmm. but I've had nausea in my life. Uh, dizziness, fatigue, uh, headaches, which we've all had, mm. uh, irritability, which we've all had. You That's know. why that case went so bad. Right. It was, could be. have been the flooring. So now I know what to blame. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, reduced mental performance. Another one. Perfusionist, you know, back there. That's yeah. Because we're, we're the ones that are the closest to, yeah, the, we're to the outlet, the right? Yes. So, yeah. you know, we're breathing it. Uh, chronic liver and kidney disease difficulties with judgment and, co uh, and coordination. You can get the cooties, which <laughs> not really, you can't really get the cooties. Um, sterili uh, uh, sterility in, in women, yep. infertility, and miscarriages, which those three most people are No, are I think aware. sterility is in men. men. Sorry, sterility, yes, yes. In, infertility. In you in have, you're, you're, clearly you're having some gender challenges here. <laughs> He's being gender fluid. <laughs> Okay. I did have them reverse, so yes, no, I yeah. agree with you entirely. That's okay. We just um, want to make sure that we just going to keep you on a straight and narrow, boy. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and then birth defects. And, mm -hmm. and, and most people are aware. In fact, a lot of people don't scavenge until they know somebody in the room is pregnant and then, oh, we better start scavenging. You know, mm -hmm. our, our I'm guesses. guilty of, I came from somewhere that scavenged. I mean, we scavenged. Every yeah. case, always. Went to a place, I scavenged in the beginning, but then no one scavenged and then it was always just me and then you're taking over someone's case and they didn't scavenge and next thing you know, right. 10 years passed and you haven't scavenged, <laughs> you know? I get it. Yep. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Uh, Nate was going to call in today. He, uh, he saw the first presentation on this and he, because of this presentation, started scavenging. Really? Well, good for so, him. Yeah. And the way he did it was very simple. He's, uh, he couldn't call in. He's on pump right now, but uh, he hooked in a quarter inch line to just really any gas outlet and I'll explain uh, any any vacuum I'll explain why believe it or not it doesn't matter which one you do we, we talk about the wagged which I'll get to in a minute but and then he just uh, cuts a little slit in the tubing so that it can't be over pressurized so mm -hmm. I think that's one of the fears or well, back or over negative or positive negative or positive well, the way we used to do it was maybe a little even more precautious um, we would take a, just a regular suction tubing we'd run it to you know the, the Neptune or whatever you're using and it, we, if this is the oxygenator exhaust outlet, we just taped it right on top, kind of just hanging over, and it's just sucking the air to come out because we, we never directly connected it. That's a good idea. 
Yeah. I never thought about that. And and you know what? So wait, it was passively coming out of the oxygenator through the tubing and then no, no near, tubing. near just, a suction? Just just out its exhaust port. And oh. then your tubing is just dangling right there. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, that would work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and that, that's how we did it. So. Huh. That's a really good idea. And it easy. freaks a lot. Uh, it's, a, you know, for people who are nervous about that people can usually be on board with, well, that's okay. That's not going right. to, you know, have too much negative pressure or whatever. So. Yeah. yeah, good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are guidelines. Um, the... I can never read it. What is it, Joe? Uh, the National, National Institute <laughs> for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. 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 Mm. Right? Niche? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they recommend uh, uh, installing a, a, a gas cabin system with the anesthesia delivery systems. They don't recommend anything for perfusion. I think it's sort of an undiscovered area of, yeah. of, uh, of people starting to talk about it. Or mm -hmm. They either do it or they don't. Is it um, enough? I mean, I guess that was going to be my question, and I don't want to interrupt your flow. No, no, please so, do. Yeah. But uh, is it enough? In other words, is yeah, depending on how many cases you is do, the risk if, enough? If you do one case mm -hmm. and you have a you know a one hour or ninety minute period or whatever it is in a given day of uh, some level of exposure, how much of that you're actually inhaling and how much everyone else is actually inhaling, I don't know, is it? It's, I'm assuming it's light, right? So it's gotta be a light molecule, it does float. Yeah, it floats. So, you know, but you're in a big room, usually they're, they have some kind of laminar flow associated with them, it's gonna, gonna go somewhere. How much are you really being exposed to in that short period of time, whereas when you do anesthesia, you do case after case after case after case after That's case. True. Right. But so for us, but we are doing a case a day mostly, at least yeah. one. Well, but, and I. But how much are you really? Yeah. How much? What is your actual exposure? I agree with that, except that we we most perfusionists, I think, know there are some inherent negative uh, results from this, whether it's negligible or whatever. But I would almost guarantee that no one else in the room knows that we are exposing them to that where just like with x-ray you know you're getting some kind of you know right you do know but that. you wear something and you monitor it and so is it our ethical responsibility to either disclose to people or to scavenge we probably should scavenge right i think so yeah i think so i think we need to do that and I, now that you've told me about that because my fear has always been i don't know how you feel john i'm very uncomfortable attaching things to that outlet port right. because the 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 if it ha if it goes wrong, it's gonna go wrong bad, mm -hmm. right? And it's catastrophic. It's not recoverable, right? Um, so you know, I've gotten away with it four times. I don't want that to be the. I don't want that to. That's be not how you're the, going out. I don't want one. that to be the end of my career, right? <laughs> so uh, well, and that so, is the number one objection mm -hmm. that perfusionists have. But I like the way so, I like the it? way. Yeah, she, they're worried about overpressurizing. Right, but yeah. the way she said it. Well, I'm worried about also the opposite. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can not only do you have to worry about overpressurization, you have to worry about negative pressure yes. too. Anything. Well, that's that what I would can, be most worried about. I think is yeah. negative pressure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because and, and um, we we also the, did a. Go ahead, John. The the original disasters that occurred when this first started were the the, the wheel of the pump rolled over the line or the yeah. PA stepped on it. Yeah. And it overpressurized the original disaster. Oh, really? World pressurization, yeah. Right. And that's why people decided they better cut a hole in it. But um, to back up for a second on your first lecture, uh, Patrick, I asked the question is it okay to hook this up to the Neptune? And um, I don't know that we had an answer to that. I mean, is the Neptune discharging the, the excess flow back into the room? Because its idea is to capture fluid. And it, right, it's not, not gas. discharging gas in right. or well, filtering it. I, I don't know the answer to I that. I have an answer to that. <laughs> Good. The, the newer, <laughs> the newer Neptunes, you're supposed to turn it on the smoke evacuator. Oh yeah. When yeah. you use it for the the gas, that's what we had determined. Would was be, that just because it has a filter? Yeah, I think. And it's, is that filter going to trap? I don't know. These. But that's these, what we uh, had discussed originally as well, um, because when I carbons. first did it, we were just put it in the suction canisters, you know, like, that's it. That's all mm -hmm. we're doing is putting in there. And at mm -hmm. some point, 
is yeah, it? but that's going to get vacuumed out because that vacuum is continuous. Yeah. Oh yeah, I guess that's the true. Suction, that's you know yeah. So that might be a safer option, is what or or more effective option, is what you are thinking. Well, I don't know. It seems to me that if it's going into Neptune, and because I think I agree with John, if it's going into that container, even if notwithstanding there's a filter, but that now if they hook it up to a wall thing and evacuate it out, then uh, that might work. Uh, but I would think that uh, you want it to be, you want it to go outside. Mm -hmm. I think you want it to go through the wag. Yeah. Maybe. No, maybe, maybe not. Okay, but that's so what you're supposed to do is I put it be, through the wag. Uh -huh. okay. I, I got to catch up on the wag here. Yeah. Well, I'll show mm -hmm. you a picture here in a second. Wag. But, um, Waste and one other thing gas. we did talk about before ah. is that, you know, what about if you have it connected to wall suction and you are flowing, you know, you're drawing. 20 liters across the membrane. I mean, you're going to have a decreased dwell time for your oxygen and your gas. Mm -hmm. So well, I think you're going to generate, unless you have a vent, you're going to have negative, you're going to have, you, you'll create negative pressure negative and pressure. you'll suck gas across and right. your and, membrane. And yeah. that's why. Or, yeah, or you'll, you'll, so we, we did a survey on that. Most people yeah. are doing uh, negative 10 liters. Mm. Negative that's 10. Their, that's their flow. This was our survey that we did on. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. The, the, that's, this seems to be the yes. accepted number. I remember negative the survey flow of 10 liters a yes. minute. <clears throat> Even so. if you're only at three liters of gas flow. Right, right. Right, but yeah, that's, with a, that's so with a side with port, a side of, port. Yeah. a vent mm -hmm. that's gonna take the path of least resistance and just, just gonna, it's not gonna present that negative of pressure to your lung. Right. To the gas to side the, of your yeah, lung. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which yeah. would, and also if you don't connect it, you don't have to worry about that if it's just in the general exhaust area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But speaking of chronic exposure, because you you mentioned, you know, oh, I just do one case, you know, is it a problem? Uh, the the NIOSH people, um, they they suggest that everybody in the room have a baseline liver and kidney function test, and that you then monitor that mm -hmm. monitor that over time. Oh. Mm -hmm. So uh, Joint Commission, we all love them. Um, they recommend that a scavenge system should be used for all anesthesia locations, which would include our, our uh, pump, I suppose. But they also they, they think it should be uh, looked at and tested and that there should be documentation on that. So, you know, they always tell you, be ready when Jayco comes. Um, this I'm, is a question they could ask you is, wow. can we see your maintenance log on your anesthesia gas from your pump salvage wow. or pump scavenge? And then AMSEC, our own our own group here, they have, you know, shoulds and, and uh, shalls, mm -hmm. and this is a shall uh, that they, they recommend that we do scavenge gas. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, their shall situation. doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot, but all right, go on. Right, well, it's well, different it's than a, a should. Well, I mean, you can't, who the hell are they to say shall? I mean, well, serious. okay. Shall. <laughs> okay, come on. You <laughs> could make something a class one recommendation if you want to, but should and shall, I mean, I think that's pretty, yeah. I think that's. Well, I commend them for, putting together some kind of standard um, standards of practice. We don't have any. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, move on. Got him on a Oh, let me get off that slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of already covered on this just from our, our covered this just to do, do our destruct, uh, to our uh, conversation, but a lot of perfusionists have concerns over, over pressurizing their membrane oxygen. It's also an extra thing to do. It's an extra thing to monitor you know, to watch out for. So mm -hmm. those are the main objections. Do they outweigh the potential, you know, health risks? You know, probably not. So I'm leaning towards, you know, we should be scavenging. Uh, on the right here, I have a picture of, you know, one way that you can do it. This is oh. just a, a why that you have. Um, where do we scavenge to? And this is really, uh, this is kind of important. We talked about WAG stands for Waste Anesthesia Gas Disposal. Hmm. And <clears throat> I ended up, uh, and then also people will scavenge it just to any <coughs> vacuum or even to the Neptune, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Now, so, Stephanie was saying you shouldn't have that side arm tubing, just have it be the open connector. Right, that way it can't be stepped on. Correct, or, or it clamped. can't be accidentally oh, clamped. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. Whatever it is. That's a right. great point. Right, but I still prefer her method. Yeah. Your method was good, because it's just, and I kind of picture like a, uh, like a funnel. Yes. You know, then yeah. you'd really be just grabbing. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. A little fun. I mean, I didn't come up with it. I was trained that way. Steve Raskin, you can thank him. Yeah. That, yeah. That's so Steve easy. That would be guy. easy to do. I like you know, You could leave that on the pump. 
yeah. you know, the tubing yeah. and everything. Well, you could use a 60cc, or you could use a, you could use one of those bulb syringes or a 60cc syringe where you take, that's one of the, uh, the turkey baster kind tip, the, what are they, catheter tip, and you pull the plunger out, put your tubing there, go to your suction, the, your, your exhaust suction, and then just tape that that um, that thing, the uh, the the syringe uh, part uh, above the thing, right there, mm -hmm. above on the, the on the oxygen, bracket. and that's going to well, give you a little bit of a funnel effect. Well, yeah. what what that that's actually brilliant. What we had done was you had a tubing that stayed attached to your oxygen bracket, and it's just always there yeah. waiting. Yeah. And that's then you just it, yeah. you just secure it, and then you just hook it up to your vacuum source, just like you like would you do with your with your other yeah. vacuum Venus source or yes. whatever. I think if we put it to the to the just the containers, yeah, um, that that is going to it's not going to go through the WAG system, mm -hmm. but it's going to go wherever that exhaust is. It's got to be better than just in the room. Well, I think so, and I think that I agree with you there. Plus, the amount of time, the amount of gas that we use, relatively low concentrations. You know, usually mm -hmm. a half one a percent, two percent, one yeah. two mm -hmm. percent, mm -hmm. depending on the gas we're using, mm -hmm. right? Um, is so low for such a short period of time, I question, I mean, over and over and over with as many cases that are done in the United States, collectively it's a lot. Mm -hmm. But in any one place, unless you're the med center where you're doing, you know, eight cases at a time um, all day long, probably, I don't know, the exposure may be pretty limited. Hmm. Might be, yeah. for any one person, maybe. Maybe. I just don't know. Yeah. That's, that's their next update. I think we need to know that. What is the exposure? Well, I think yeah, finding a little more in a little more detailed information out about yeah. what is what is the actual exposure risk? You know, what is the concentration? What's are we the really percentage of right? How much yeah. these things? I how much know. of how much of that gas are we? Because I don't know of any perfusionist who has ever had a a, uh, a halogenated you know fluorocarbon uh, disease or, or 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 problem that was pointed back to their job as a perfusionist. I don't know anybody that's ever had that. And I would think after all these years, if somebody did, would know it. Hmm. Could be, yeah. Hey, um, can I throw something in here, guys? What sure. would be interesting is what about the patient? How many patients who've had a 12-hour operation? We had a very long yeah. re-operation, uh -huh. and they were directly right. exposed to this right. for multiple hours, maybe even multiple days in the ICU, whatever they're using. And we're getting a fraction of that. Um, and what about these list of complications you, you showed a few slides back? How many patients have had sterility or you know these complications because of maybe they had a few surgeries in their life and they were long long surgeries with direct exposure? They're I, cumulative I, effect. I maybe can't more imagine. Greater than all the words. Yeah, I can't. I intuitively and again, it's just an opinion, but it's in my 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 instincts tell me that that's implausible as well. I think that if you work in the operating room and you're venting this stuff into the room and you work there every day, day after day after day after day, year after year after year after year, that exposure is way more than one or two or even three, eight, 10, 12 hour surgeries in a lifetime. I mean, I, I can't imagine that that's, equivocal and again these gases have been used so much for so long that i think if that morbidity or risk was associated with it again i feel pretty good at it would know it by now hmm. i think so and certainly not going to use it in the, the ICU. i don't know anybody that uses the same may be true of medical gas workers gas. um who spent their whole life in the operating room I'd be interested to know how many people really have any of these um, side effects, you know. And well, and well, I know I'm not sterile, so, you know, and I may have confusion, but I'm not sterile. Well, <laughs> they're irritable. And yeah. uh, they're so <laughs> generic of uh, issues that would it even be traced back to something like this? Probably yeah. not. And it's the same thing if you end up with a birth defect. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that could cause that. Mm -hmm. And one of them might be this, but is anybody going to point to this? You know, probably not. Know, you know? Yeah, probably not. Probably not. And that could be the same thing with liver and kidney problems. Right. Yeah. I just hope. I just hope some law firm 
you know, that advertises on TV. Is watching today. Class action. Is not watching. Yeah, class. I hope they're not watching. It's the last we'll thing we need now. Will be the next asbestos. Yes. We right. could all get paid. Huh? It will be the next asbestos. Oh, God. <laughs> we don't need this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not there yet. Okay, let me talk a little bit about uh, a few things that we've kind of started already to talk about. But um, so there is an, uh, let's first talk about the WAGD and the wall suction. So wall suction by the, the people who build hospitals have standards as well. And wall suction is to be vented out of the hospital at least 10 feet from any entrance or any okay. vent, all right? Mm -hmm. The WAGD is also vented into the air, but has to be further than 10 feet. From, okay. So it, it all goes out into the into the sky either yeah. way. Right? Yeah. And there's a, and here's what's interesting is you'd be surprised there's so much surgery going on. First off, so desflurane is 20 times as powerful at trapping heat in the Earth's atmosphere than uh, isoflurane and sevoflurane, which is one reason maybe people are using less of the desflurane. And are you looking at me evil because I'm bringing up the environment? No. Okay. No. <laughs> I'm cheering you on because you're a, bringing up the environment. I'm a tree hugger. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't say I'm a tree hugger. I'm just, you know, I, I don't like heat so much. But anyway, um, <laughs> and uh, so um, ISO and SIVO have global warming potential, uh, um, potential of 20,000 times greater than carbon dioxide. So oh my Lord. put it all together. Oh how, much, how much do you think, like automobile, just guess, how much do automobiles contribute to greenhouse gases? I in weight? Number. No, just in percentage. Percentages? Percentage in percentage of what's up there, yeah. In greenhouse gases, yeah, probably I don't know. I'll say, I'll say, eight to ten percent is my guess. What about you? Somewhere around fifteen to twenty. I don't know. Okay, I'm so you, the statistic I found was twenty nine percent for, oh, for automobiles, yeah. right? Very <laughs> high. Well, maybe it's less from here and more in you know. I drive a Tesla. Well, okay, zero. But yeah, well, we make the electricity somehow, but no, it, there, it's there, it's never zero. This is true. You have to, but it's make, it's probably better. But it's much better. Yeah. Yes. And we'll all take one. So mm. who's the tree hogger now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So going on. So so, but these gases that and and these are not the ones that are released into the air just from like refrigeration and such. This is these are the gases that are that come from surgery. Ten percent is. They contribute 10 percent to wow, the to the global crop, which is a lot. That's it's a huge. Lot. If you, automobiles if are are, are 29 percent, and these are 10, and it's because you need far less, you know, to cause the same problem. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. yeah. That right. is so interesting. Yeah. That's a lot of surgery. So there is a device, which I do not have a picture of, but there is a device that actually can scavenge our scavenged air and recycle the gases to be reused. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. That's probably very expensive. Tree hugger medicine. I yeah. love it. <laughs> that makes that makes that makes a lot of sense. It actually does. But it makes yeah. me wonder whether of course everything we do, everything. Everything has know, an impact. Everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. We're here we're going to have an impact. But um there's some reason why, you know, milk of amnesia, you know, we'll fuck, well if we used it exclusively it would be some kind of issue. I think we do use it almost all the time on surgery. Yeah. I'm sure we're going to find some issue with its production or its disposal or well, even just going be. down to and i'm a big recycler but even the recycling process has its own negative effects yes do you know what i mean yes you absolutely. need other anesthesia um drugs uh, just uh, no glass cans you know, all of the yeah. normal Plastics. things yeah yeah we throw away an enormous stuff in the operating room I do yeah. think about that sometimes when I'm opening all those containers and throwing it all well, away. Well, you know what I Everything's think? in a package, you know, mm -hmm. which it has to be. But you and know. they're huge. Well, yeah. and even just what should be going in the biohazard and what shouldn't, the biohazard has to be disposed in a different way, and it's very costly. Yes. They burn it, I think, right? And it's weighed, and yeah. you're billed by Incinerated, that. Incinerated, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And even just how some hospitals are really strict, this is red, this is not red, and um, it, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you go throwing, you know, uh, bottles and other things in the, in the uh, well, bottles would be okay, but in the red bags. In the red bags. Right. Well, not even the just the, container. the, yeah. the what's, what's it called? The, the bins, the bowls what, that yeah. they put our lines in? Yes. Even mm -hmm. just not putting that in there and just dumping your lines and taking it out 
can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. That's what I got. That's it. All That's right. it. Well, that Thank was you. very good. Okay. John? Oh, survey results. We, we oh. already talked about those. Yeah. yeah. Yes. We don't have a new survey. Yeah. Why not? Uh, we just don't. Um, we kind of covered it before. Yeah. But uh, I will say, you know, we're, we're, we're not all, I'm, I'm, I'll say I'm not scavenging, not because I'm against it, it's just because I've been trying at, at least one of our hospitals very hard to, to get that set up. And there's uh, that, that wagged that I show you, showed you has a, a specific kind of uh, thread on it. And in order to hook anything to it, you have to have that connector. So it's mm -hmm. all a process, biomed and all of that. Oh, it's so hard to do. I mean, we've, we've, I, I found the product, I found the manufacturer, the order number, you know, it's been ordered, but it hasn't come yet. And it, it's, you know, it's been two months, so. Mm -hmm. Well, and mm -hmm. the way things are, I don't know now, but when institutions have gone to only buying from certain suppliers, and if your supplier doesn't have what you need, it can just really complicate, mm -hmm, yeah. even if it's something you actually mm -hmm. need. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as pump clamps. I tried to order once. Mm -hmm. Did you get your clamps? I got my clamps. Good, um, all nine of them? Yeah, and Perfect. I haven't found another one, so I have 10 now. You ordered your own Good. clamps? I've had my own clamps. Oh, yeah, I have my own too. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, anyway, but we were doing so much ECMO, we needed some more clamps. Right. The, um, process can be extremely difficult. Uh, I found a place to order clamps from. It was much less expensive than the third party, all of this other stuff that we had to, but in the end, I had to order from that. You know, it's like ordering for the government. You can only go through the approved vetted vendors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so with something specialized as that, when they're not used to ordering it, mm -hmm. it can be hard. Right, yeah, mm -hmm. well it is, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, very good. Um, any closing remarks? Is John here? There's John. Yeah, John, John you have any thoughts, comments, closing remarks? About the anesthesia guys? Ah, about anything. Anything. Did you get to hear? Um, well, I did have uh, quite a bit of thoughts about the uh, the heparin. I figured. Uh, existent thing that I would really like to, to see if you guys hit on, because I didn't catch a lot of that. Uh-huh. You know, Joe, and all you guys are probably going to remember, all this HIT, heparin resistance and things like that. If you go back when we used to use bovine heparin, right? When yeah. all the heparin was bovine heparin, we had an enormously less incidence of all this stuff. Yeah, yes. You know, I remember doing hundreds and hundreds of cases and we give the 30,000 units of heparin and bam, the APT was always above 480 and you went on pump and you just didn't have an issue. Mm -hmm. And it was so rare that we just couldn't get the patients ACT above 480 that we didn't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And then when this whole thing changed to porcine heparin, you find variability in its potency, right, from day to day. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you'd have much more difficulty a lot of times. It's almost like, what was he, somebody's, I uh, think your presentation said 10 to 15% of the time that patients have, or in Four that to study, 22. It Four said to 22. 10 to 15% of the people yeah. had a hard time getting above 480 with the initial dose. Was that, was that not right? Uh, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one in ten or more than one in ten patients you're having to give additional heparin. And if you still can't give enough, you end up doing the thrombate or FFP or something. I mean, this used to be almost non-existent uh, 25, 30 years ago. And, and the porcine heparin, I think, is much more variability in its potency. And the, the incidence of HIT, uh, Joe, maybe you can speak to this. Do you think we used to see HIT in the 80s and 90s? No. Uh, like you do now? No, absolutely not. Now, I mean, I did see, and it was in the 80s, uh, was the first time, in fact, it was in the late 80s, the first time that I ever saw true heparin-induced uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenia, uh, or what they called at the time white clot syndrome. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, and you know, the patient's fingers and toes and everything got black, yeah. and they, I mean, they, they, it killed them. Um, but it was very rare. It was the first time I had seen it, and I didn't see it again for a very long period of time. And then somewhere in the 2000s, I guess early 2000s, I started hearing uh, people giving uh, presentations on using uh, Reapro. I think it was Reapro, wasn't it first? Or was it Argatraban? What was first? It was Angiomax. Right? Angiomax. Was it Angiomax first? That's the first one that I heard the of. The first one. And it was around 2000 yeah. and 
2003, 2004. Yeah, something like that. And I was like, what the heck is all that about? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't see that. And I used to do a lot. I was doing a lot of cases. I was like, I don't see that. Where's that coming from? Mm -hmm. And for, for a very long time, I felt it was uh, an overdiagnosed. I mean, heparin, if you give anyone heparin, doesn't matter who it is, uh, you know, they don't have to have hit. Uh, that you're going to have some decrease in your platelet count just mm -hmm. from anybody. Um, it's whether or not it becomes pathologic, it becomes, you know, you start having thrombotic events or your platelet count falls to a, you know, to a level that is dangerously low. But th that's usually because the platelets are aggregating. I mean, that's what causes your platelet count to go down. Mm -hmm. so they aggregate, you have embolic events. Mm -hmm. So I think it's overdiagnosed. Um, and uh, and and overreacted to. I don't I don't know, but I don't think we saw it as often. I think porcine heparin is a lot dirtier a heparin. I do think that. I agree with you there. Well, I worked at a place in 2015, and uh, at a pretty large uh, metropolitan area, it covered two different hospitals, and for whatever reason, we had such a problem with having to give multiple doses of heparin that the surgeons, the anesthesiologists. And we're always coming to us saying, why are we having to give additional heparin? We'd, be, we, we'd wait the whole, this surgeon would not go on until it went to 480. Mm -hmm. If it stopped at 410, we gave more heparin, we have to wait another eight minutes to see if it went to 480. So he was tapping his foot during the case, why can't we get, and it happened so often that we actually took, on numerous occasions, stopped using that lot number yeah. and went to another lot number of heparin, called the pharmacy, said, send us a different lot number. Yeah. Eventually, we even changed the brand the company, the, the pharmaceutical John, company we that, that we were buying well. it from. And at one point, we even put a blog out on the, on the Perfusion websites. Is anybody else seeing this? Mm -hmm. And we really didn't get a whole lot of feedback. Now, I went to m many other places since then, and I saw it to the, about the 1 in 10, 1 in 20 cases, but nothing like we did at this one particular uh, case. And, and it, it really just stuck with me that, you know, we just didn't have issues like this years ago. And it, it, it has to be something with this, uh, you know, the bovine heparin was so much more consistent, so much more predictable, and maybe even high, less less allergenic, you know, in a, a lot of ways to be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it may very well be. I mean, I think you may be right. And uh, why did I, we switch? Anybody know why we switched? Mad cow. Mad cow. Oh, mad cow. Okay. Yeah, yeah mad cow disease. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. Our, when all that happened, yeah. everything got pulled. Yeah. Yeah. And when was that? What year was that? Oh, a long time uh, ago. I guess it was in the, it was, I think it was in the... Uh, I mean, I was well, practicing, I know. It was... Early 2000s, wasn't it, Joe? Yeah, early 2000s? Maybe like 2005 or something? Yeah, maybe something. a little late. 2005, somewhere yeah, somewhere probably around, around there. Cause that's maybe when 2008. Some, it was definitely early in yeah. my career. Yeah. Uh, I think it was around 2008, because I'm trying to think of what institution I was It was, was actually in. before, because we were still using a protonin. Mm -hmm. And... And uh, uh, a protein yeah, right. was being made in um, the only place that the cow lungs came from was it was a country in South America, and I'm trying to remember the name of the country now. But they had never, gosh, dog it, I can't remember the name of the country. But it was one particular country that had no recorded uh, mad cow disease. Uh, outbreak or, mm -hmm. or 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 cow that had it, mm -hmm. um, and that was the only place where they got the lungs from to produce the uh, aprotin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, well that would have had to have been around 2004, 2005, because I remember doing. Yeah, well, a I can look it up. I got a study computer right here while you're of, talking. Of uh, aprotin versus Amacar during that particular. Uh, yes, I, yes. I yeah. think you're gonna find. Yeah, very really close, but I even think it goes back 2003, mm. 2002 was when we first started having issues and things like that. Mm. And people were like, well, because I remember at a time we had both porcine yeah. and heparin in, in stock. And you could just yeah, decide could which one you wanted to use. Yeah. Actually, so eventually 19. they faded out the, the, bo the bo uh, Well, I, I think It says the epidemic reached its peak in 1992 and 1993 in Europe. Yeah, but I don't think we had the effects here because I wasn't. I didn't hadn't even thought of perfusion yet, and I know that we had an, a point where there was a, the whole discussion about the, all the bovine had to be removed from the pixis and all those sorts of things. I remember that going on. Yes. Yeah, I remember that too. But I, you know, and all the secret stashes. 
the places that <laughs> There's lots of secret stashes. People keep yeah. peppering. So December of 2003, the U.S. Department of Agriculture mm-hmm. confirms the first case of mad cow disease in the United States. Yes. And it was mm-hmm. discovered in, on a farm in Washington State, no doubt, a liberal state. Um, <laughs> had to be there. Out, I knew it had to be there. <laughs> Do you guys have Probably a, uh, in Seattle. a circuit Started that is a hit circuit, like you have a, a, a non-biocoded hit circuit that you use on hit patients? Or? Yeah, we don't use any, any heparin bonded, yeah. no, no, uh, no heparin bonded circuits at all. We use it's we physical, use everything, right? right. Yeah. Everything we use it's is the a non-biologic. Non, it, yeah, it's non-biologic uh, uh, coding. Yes. I right. worked at a place that had two circuits. You had the uh, the. the bonded circuit and then you had the, mm-hmm. the patients who were hit you would have a separate circuit for them god i remember I, which really i think was the just well no i don't know at all yeah, yeah. and was, remember that even the cannulas uh you know the ephemeral cannulas mm-hmm. some were heparin coated yeah yeah, yeah the some Medtronic were not ones, mm-hmm. yes. Cause yeah. everybody had those the green yeah. box and the non-green yeah, box exactly yeah. and uh yeah but then you know latex allergy is even worse mm. that's even worse I mean, I remember places that would have this hyper, hyper reactivity to somebody with a latex allergy, and oh my God, and they would, you know, I mean, the 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 uh, the little duckbill valve on the one-way valve on the pump was latex, and they couldn't use that, and oh. it was oh. a big deal. I mean, they made, I a, even, big, they I made a bigger deal out of that than they did than they did hit in this particular place that I was working. Huh? They were very, very, very hypersensitive to latex allergy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Go well, good. Uh, any final thoughts, John? Well, one last thing on that paper on the Journal Club. I um, I just found it interesting that patients that are more predisposed to uh, heparin resistance were chronic aortic dissection patients. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I've seen, yeah. a, I've seen a lot of heparin resistance. I don't know how many of those were well, aortic dissection patients. Uh, right, and I thought that was interesting too. The actual well, I, numbers were mm-hmm. seven of the twenty-five, and some of that, you know, you can be statistically significant, and it's not really significant. It's just how the cases lined up for yeah. those years. I think it's just. I think it's just. But it's I interesting. Think it's just an inflammatory yeah. process. That's what I think. I think that you know, chronic aortic dissection. I believe is an inflammatory disease. Um, I think that you know uh, patients who have who are septic, they have uh, they have hypercoagulability, right? They eventually go into DIC if you mm-hmm. don't get them under control. So that happens. Um, I just think that that's. I just think it's all. Everything you mentioned were people that yeah. have I mean, chronic inflammatory processes. If you could read my notes, inflammation. This is from inflammation. I mean, that's yeah. everything that uh, I'm highlighted all had some tie to inflammation yeah uh-huh. that's yeah. what I yeah I can see that I can and, that and would, I think that's the thing with the COVID yeah I think the COVID is when you have a cytokine you know an uncontrolled cytokine storm I understand everybody that gets infected with the virus everybody has a cytokine storm but an uncontrolled cytokine storm I think uh, becomes a runaway cytokine storm is uh, is uh, is going to make you susceptible to hypercoagulability more so uh, than other, you know, other disease processes. Mm -hmm. So I think influenza probably has the same thing. Mm -hmm. I would think that that COVID is not more hypercoagulable because it's COVID. I think it's more hypercoagulable than a normal you know, I don't think it's. Have I don't think seen, it's more or less. Have you seen the COVID toes on some of the patients and things? Yeah, I mean, I've seen, but I've seen that before. I saw that with H one N one. I saw H one N one toes. Okay. okay. I mean, you know, I've seen it. I've seen. I've I don't remember hearing about it. patients being hypercoagulable during the H one N one when we were doing all the ECMOs. Like mm. that, we were. You know, I don't think we were even using PTT to manage. I think we were still ACT back no, then. No, we had gone to PTTs. We had. We went to PTTs in 2011. I think we were 11. I think we were late to the game yeah. where I was watching ECMOs, and so we were still doing AC, ACTs then. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 And of course, that's another topic. I think I think ACTs are so wildly inaccurate uh, for low range. When you get into low range ACTs, mm. I think that's just that's not a good way to manage your uh, 
your heparin management for anticoagulation strategy for ECMO patients. I think you need to use. I PTT. think most people have switched yeah. to PTT now, at least after the first 24 hours. Some some places I know mm -hmm. do the first, you know, until you're out of, over in the ICU and you've gotten the patient settled. And usually, you know, it's about mm -hmm. 24 hours running ACTs. Yeah. Well, I just you know, draw an ACT just to prove that we we anticoagulated. You know, right. I don't think it shows any amount of anticoagulation. It just shows that it's higher than normal. Right, mm. you know, right. You chart that you put the heparin in and the patient got the heparin, you might as well show that you had an elevated ACT. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. Okay, any final thoughts, Patrick? Uh, were, the, were the H1N1 patients as inflammatory as the COVID patients are? I, I wouldn't think, I didn't think they really were. Because the, the COVID patients are so inflammatory. Then we had ECMO and we escalated mm -hmm. even further. I mean, we did that with the H1N1s, we got a lot of ECMO, but were they, was there a baseline disease response as inflammatory as COVID, I would tend to think maybe they were not. Well, I mean, you know, they got, they certainly developed ARDS mm -hmm. um, yeah. and their lungs were pretty stiff. You know, I mean, it depended on what hospital you were at, but you know, I remember, you know, a lot of people, I don't know why, um, and maybe it was just my experience, I don't, my personal experience, but I remember um, one hospital, I uh, won't say where, um, where I was, you know, I had so many patients that needed to be on ECMO that I was taking ECMOs that I was using in a research lab uh, because that's literally all I had. Um, and uh, there were good pumps. There was nothing wrong with them. There were good pumps, uh, but you know they were they previously were being used in a research lab, um, and uh, uh, you know ran a lot of patients on those. Um, and it wasn't just one; it was several. Um, we were taking uh, diverted cases from uh, the medical center from St. Luke's. I remember uh, Dr. Matoyer calling me up and saying, "Look, I mean, we we you know we need we need to get another patient up here. We you know can we handle this?" So I had the same exact. Uh, I was in the same boat. So your experience was, was the same. Yeah, it was it was it was the same, but it was um, the first round of this of this COVID thing was not. Yeah. was nothing. I mean, yeah, I was, was like, well, that's nothing. The second surge seemed to be a little more exciting um, and, you know, and difficult to manage, certainly. But the H1N1 thing, it went on it forever. Felt like it, it didn't feel like there was huge surges. It just felt like it started and then we just had ECMOs. Yes. Just yes. ECMO after ECMO. And it just yes. was continuous for like three or four months, just solid. Every yes. day you had... Every day, nonstop. Yeah. And I think that... Uh, and I think that's really why we have gone to ECMO the way we have, because we had we had really good results. And nationally, the way they're reported is essentially a, a 60 to 70 percent survival for VV ECMO for influenza-related uh, ARDS. And that came out, I think it was the CESAR trial is what it was. but. Um, so the, 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 the survival rate is, was really high, was great, because um, without it, we were looking at 100% yeah, mortality, 100%. right? I um, mean, these people were definitely sick. And I think from that experience, we've actually gotten even better. Have you seen numbers with, on COVID nationally? I haven't, um, but I have an event, which is not good, um, and which are very, very poor. If you go on the vent, apparently, you don't come off the vent. Now, a lot of places, and we've had this discussion many times, do not have ECMO. Yeah. They just do not provide that as the therapeutic modality. So they're on the ventilator, and then the ventilator is, is also inadequate, and those patients do not survive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so survival on that's bad. I haven't seen the numbers for ECMO and uh, what this last round of ECMO is, but the first experience taught us that earlier initiation and that's where the greater than seven days, actually, you know, greater than seven days of, of maximal ventilatory support is a contraindication for ECMO, but we're still going beyond that and still putting yeah. patients on yeah. ECMO. So it's like we learned the lesson, but then we forgot the lesson. So my suspicion is we're gonna find that when we look at all this data, somebody's really smart is going to have to do it and really, you know, weed through it, uh, make it granular, as they say, and pick out all this stuff. 
I think we're going to find the exact same thing. Yeah. And I think the survival for earlier initiation is going to be about the same as it was for H1N1. And I think that the later initiation is going to be about what it was for H1N1, which was dismal and uh, for later initiation. And then I think we'll relearn the lesson and hopefully won't forget it when the next one happens. The for early initiation. Or, right. For yeah. less than seven days on the vent. Yes. Yeah. 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 And maximum. And, and you know, right now your, F, your PAO2, FIO2 ratio of 300 is you, can, you should consider ECMO. A PAO2, FIO2 ratio of 200 or below, ECMO is clearly indicated. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you see, if you were to measure it daily, or maybe a couple of times a day, and you go from 300 to 280 to 260, you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yet you sit there now day three, day four, it's 220, day five, it's 180. And now you start having these other issues well, and you're like, well, maybe this isn't a good candidate now. And then you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait. Well, and then you put on ECMO. I think you've trashed the lungs. I agree. But don't you think now, too, especially in a crisis like this, where things are finite, you only have so many ECMOs, you, only, you have to be selective. You have to be selective. Right. But it's a fine line to being selective and then letting a patient go too long. Yes. Because you're trying to see, well, maybe they'll rebound and I can save it for that patient that didn't even last that long. Absolutely. So Absolutely. It is a very, it is a, uh, yeah, those are... Those are decisions that have to be made, um, and you know, uh, thankfully not by me. Not by me either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then letting a patient. Uh huh. No problem. Yeah. Okay, uh, Tammy. Final thoughts. No, that's it. That's all I got. Did you ever get your final thoughts done? My final thoughts are done. Your final thoughts are mm -hmm. done. Your final yeah. thoughts are done. Yeah. My final thoughts are done. John, thanks for joining thanks us for again. Yeah. yeah. Great to see you, John. Great presentation, Tammy. Excellent journal club again. Um, Not as good I, as last week, though. <laughs> or, <laughs> much better. We, uh, we tried yeah. water the best we could without you, Tammy. Oh, I'm sure it was great. We did. I hope you watch it. Oh, you it. did it. I haven't I seen it yet. Watch it. I was I get, on my Listen, last I really week. missed you. So we're going to see you Thursday, August 20th at 1700 hours Central Time. All times are Central Standard Time, okay? or I guess Central Daylight Time, it could be either, but Central Time Zone, all right? Five o'clock, high arterial pressure during cardiopulmonary bypass uh, may not reduce, reduce the risk of acute kidney injury. John, that's one you're gonna love. John, you better be here. And then M&M &M, uh, on another uh, neat case that's in the, uh, in the legal literature. So thank you all very much. We will talk to you then. And in the meantime, you wanna reach out to us, you know how to do it, perfusioneducation.com perfweb.us, contact at perfusioneducation.com, call us up, do whatever, send us a tweet, send us a uh, Facebook message, send us a YouTube message. We try to answer everything and we appreciate all of you for joining us today and appreciate your support and uh, continued involvement. Thank you all very much. See you on the 20th. Bye. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary as we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community. The need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOC device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're going to screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts turning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, 
we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. 
Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today.